But the, the point that I want to really get to here is really a discussion of automatic differentiation, what's going on with automatic differentiation, um, and how do you actually use it in practice, right? Because I think that, you know, for, for this community, I think a lot of the discussion has been around what are, the what are the ways that we can make use of Julia as a tool for doing, you know, more advanced data analysis uh, with respect to the kinds of models and things that we know within the HEP community, right? And so I think one of the big pieces within what, what, what that, you know, that could make sense to make use of with Julia is the things around SciML and the whole modeling tools that, uh, that exist here. And so I kind of want to dig into, you know, what is this all about? What does it mean? And how can you do a lot of smart things to just make model fitting better? Um, quick outline of what we're going to go through because there's going to be a lot of things here. Um, the first thing is we're going to understand derivatives and their potential issues. Here, how many people think you know what cal how, uh, no calculus? All right, cool. Uh, I, I love asking you at the start because then after doing uh, after doing like an hour of how do you calculate derivatives, I like to ask that again and uh, I think a lot of people change their mind on that, right? But then, uh, then the second thing is just how can uh, how must simulators uh, be modified in order to do fitting process, right? So if you're going to be fitting things to simulators, you know, how do you actually do that? How or how do you modify your simulation? And then I'm going to talk about some other things that go on within this this space of you know mixing machine learning into simulation and data analysis and, and this whole piece. So what are alternatives to direct simulation? So just kind of uh, some of the, the disperse some ideas about some alternatives to things that are requiring automatic differentiation. And then I just want to talk about the performance of simulators and deep learning if I get there. Uh, last time I ran this kind of workshop, I don't think I got there within the three hour budget. So uh, so we'll see if we get there. But um, so the prologue, though, is what why do we want to do a differential simulation? So, you know, what is differential simulation? Why are we differentiating simulators and, and why do why do we care about this in the first place? Um, so. And the start of this is really we do a lot with what's known as universal differential equations or universal approximator differential equations. So the core idea behind this is the fact that. You know, if you think about what a neural network is, you might think about it as, oh, a neural network is something that does, you know, data analysis, machine learning. No, 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 no. Take all that, crinkle it up, throw it in, you know, Kobe, throw that into the trash can, right? Uh, the idea of what a neural network is, is a neural network is a function uh, that is, it takes in N objects, spits out M objects, but it has the very specific property that if the neural network is sufficiently large, then you can find weights such that for any possible function, it can approximate that function epsilon close, right? So, you know, this is this is this uh, universal, universal approximation uh, theorem, right? Which is why we call these uh, uh, uni uh, universal differential equations, right? Ba basically, it's the idea that, you know, uh, for all, you know, F, in some nice mathematical space, right? Um, that is also unlike a, a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, again, I'm going to be leaving off like the core mathematical details here. But you know, for for every f that you can find, you know, that is sufficiently nice, um, there exists, um, there exists, uh, you know, you know. Uh, okay, so if your neural network is big enough. You know, so if it's big enough, what do I mean by big enough? I mean, you know, are your hidden layers large enough or the number of layers large enough? Basically, if you have enough parameters, right, then then there exists uh, there exists parameters theta such that um, neural network uh, with parameters theta on X, it spits out values and it will be able to match at, uh, F of X, you know, less than epsilon for all x in some space, which is a, you know, close set makes it easier, right? But I mean, you know, you can generalize this in proof and you have to kind of specify like, okay, is f continuous and et cetera, et cetera. But this is the general idea, right? So a neural network is not a thing that does data science. It's not a thing that does data analysis. It's a function approximator. And it has this property that if you choose a big enough neural network, it can approximate any functions as close as you want, right? So what? For every yeah, for every epsilon, you get a cookie. Um, so okay, so so 
So what do we want to do with this kind of object then? Well, what we want to do with it is we just want to have it be a parameterized object that lets us learn functions, right? Since it is a thing that can approximate arbitrary functions, we want to learn functions with it. So what we could do is you could say, well, let's say I have a mathematical model. So this is a model of predator prey. And so we have this model that says, you know, uh, the amount of bunnies when left in isolation grows exponentially. And then the amount of wolves, uh, it, you know, when left alone, it dies off exponentially fast. And if you put rabbits and wolves in a room together, my mother never really told me what happens, right? But there's some interaction between these rabbits and wolves, um, but we don't know how to model it, right? So this is a mathematical model where not only am I missing information, but I know that I'm missing information. And I basically am saying there is some arbitrary function that goes there, right? Um, so I want to kind of show building up to this in practice at first as like a, a, a nice, simple introduction. So the first thing is, so here is not the rabbit and wolves. But this is a case uh, from, from some epidemic modeling, right, where we, where we say, okay, we have 21 days worth of epidemic data, so up to this black line. And then we, we fit a model and then we, we extrapolate to the future, right? Um, and so, okay, uh, first, thing, first thing is you just say, okay, you prime... You know, uh, so I'm going to model it with the with the differential equation, right? What differential equation am I going to choose? Is it going to be alpha u? No, I, I I don't. You know, well, okay, maybe if it's at, if if it's a pandemic, you might want to guess it's at an exponential. But no, you know, I I don't know the model. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say the u prime equals a neural network of u, right? It's any possible function that could be this differential equation, right? And so what I do is I, I fit any possible function from zero to 21 days worth of pandemic data, and I extrapolate into the future. And I do the neural, and I do the machine learning thing, and I very confidently say that, you know, hey, COVID-19 is not going to be that bad. But, you know, what, 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 what's, what's gone wrong here? Well, what's gone wrong is that the, 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 the basic way of doing machine learning, right, of just fitting a neural network, what goes wrong here is that the, the number of, you know, if you think about it in the space of functions, right? You know, the, the set of possible functions that can fit this and, you know, is, is very large. So, you know, there's, a, you know, straight line, quadratics, exponentials. This is not enough data to really learn what that function is, right? So we learn a function that fits the data. And then we, from the hat that we've chosen one function to fit the data, we extrapolate forward very confidently. And we say, this is what we believe will happen, right? But see, the issue here is that we have not really specified more details about the, the space of functions that we want to actually be learning in, right? So how can, I, how can I start to impart that, you know, I want a function that satisfies all of my prior knowledge about how a pandemic should work, right? This is when we start to get to these universal differential equations. So here, for example, is a SEIRD model, right? So it's, a, it's a, one of these types of pandemic models where you have susceptible individuals become exposed Exposed individuals uh, get infected. Infected individuals either recover or something that starts with a D, right? Um, and so, what what happens? What happens here is that you know, a we can use prior prior knowledge or other sets of data to be able to know some of this information, right? So, in a scientific model, you can use heterogeneous data to be able to say, well, what are the percentage of people who who die versus uh, recover from the disease? That's going to be this ratio between these parameters, right? So there's a lot of external information we can use to come up with a lot of these uh, par parameter information, right? But the thing that we don't know in this model is how do people actually get exposed to the disease? How do you model exposure to COVID-19 when someone in China had a completely different experience than someone in Sweden or Italy or the United States? Or in the United States, it depended on you know, whether you're in a red state or a blue state that could completely change the dynamics of the, of, of the disease, right? So how do you come up with one simple function that models the exposure to this disease? I don't know. And this neural network is essentially just a, you know, a shrug emoji, right? It's a, it's a mathematical shrug emoji saying, I don't know what to put here. Please do an arbitrary function for me, right? So this, so this, is, the, this is the way to think about it. Now, if you actually think about it from a math, you know, so that's like the high level standpoint. From a mathematical standpoint, what we specified is a function that is, uh, that we, we, what we specified is a function that actually has a lot of properties that we would want in order to be able to constrain the function space that it lives in, right? So if you think about the solution to this ODE as being our neural network now, you know, there's a neural network that inside of here, but our neural network is the solution to this ODE. Well, what are the properties that it has? Well, let's, let's say that we have this neural network, right? Um, just to put us all on the same page here. 
what do neural networks generally look like? Well, what you do is you say, I have you know, a, a, a matrix of weights. I multiply it and I, and I do an add. Then I do some function to it and I multiply and then I add and I do some function to it. And you just keep on doing that same process, right? So these are, this is what you call a dense, a, a dense uh, layer. It's multiply, add, and then do a nonlinear function to it. So let's say, let's say that this last nonlinear function is an absolute value, right? So this is uh, just, you know, absolute value of u as, as the as the last piece, right? So already right here, I've already constrained some information, right? This neural network does not live in the space of all functions. You know, this is for all, you know, this neural network, if I put an absolute value on the end here, it's for all f that, are, that spit out positive values, you know, this is approximator of only positive functions, right? And now, what can I do with this approximator to a positive function? Well, if s prime, well, let's look at this, s prime, uh, this is going to be negative, this is going, well, minus a positive, minus a positive, minus a positive. So s prime is always negative, right? And so, uh, and so from, from the design of these, these equations, you know that the a number of susceptible people to this, uh, to, uh, to this disease is always decreasing, right? In fact, you could even show that it has an exponential phase at the start. Um, now, if, if you also have that S is always decreasing, then uh, by the definition of E, you have it positive, uh, you have it positive, positive, negative. Well, you can actually be able to show that this should actually have one peak, right? Because there's going to be a peak at the point where S gets sufficiently low, where, the, uh, where these uh, values end up e uh, equaling. And so therefore you're gonna have one point where there's a, where the, there's a derivative equal to zero. And so the number of people who are exposed to the disease and then the number of people who are infected to the, by the disease, it's going to go up and then it's going to go down, right? And then you know we have the number of people recovering and dying, they're gonna be going up, right? So this is in, in a sense, what we've, de what we've defined here is that you know, we're now saying like, we're not learning all possible functions. What we're saying in this form is, this is, this is a representation of all possible functions such that the number of susceptible individuals is always decreasing and the number of, expe uh, of exposed and infected individuals is going to have one hump, you know, et cetera. And so if you, if you think about it like that, we've now constrained the function space to have a lot of the properties that we would expect from an epidemic, uh, from, from an epidemic by putting it in the form of an epidemic model. And then we say, okay, now let's learn the function approximator that is the neural network for this exposed model, given the data that we have. And from that same data, from zero to 21 days worth of data, it's able to learn a much better approximation to what's going on in the future. Because again, you know, it's, it's, if our function space uh, approximations are correct, right, then learning a function f from this smaller function space should always be able to be at least as good as learning one from the larger function space, right? But that's a mathematical way of saying it. If you, if you don't want to say it in the mathematical way, you could just say, you know, this is a machine learning architecture that is more epidemic and therefore it does better on epidemics, right? But it's, you know, in, in either way you, you look at it, it's kind of getting to the same point in the end, right? But now, in, in, now the next thing though is that, okay, we have a computational representation to the thing that we did not know how to model. So what we could do is we can actually pull this out, right? We, we now, we've now trained this object. We've trained this object so that way we can give it values and it's gonna give us out values and it'll act just like the function that would have uh, that would have gone there in the first place. So you can start to do analyses. You can ask questions like, you know, which variables is this a function of? Which variables is it not a function of? You know, what is the best simple representation to this function, right? And so here, for example, we run a symbolic regression so what we do is we take this function that we've learned and we just uh, we we put in a bunch of values for you know uh, s i uh, s i and d or I think that those are, it was a function of s i and d right so we put a bunch of values in for s i and d we get a bunch of values out for what it predicts goes in the function there and then it has it it, it spits out like oh yeah hey this is my representation of the function and you do a symbolic regression on the data that from the input output pairs. And then you can actually have it tell you, you know, the function that you were missing in your equation here was i times, you know, some constant plus s divided by n times i plus some constant s of it by the end, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, importantly, this tells you, this tells us two pieces of information. One thing is that it's predicting that, uh, it's effectively predicting that like things like the number of people who have died is not a, uh, the exposure is not a, fu a function of the number of people who've died, which mechanistically for COVID-19 makes sense. 
because people who have already died are not exposing people to COVID-19, right? But you can read that off, you can read that prediction off directly from the symbolic prediction. And the other thing that you get from this is you generally tend to get a lot of, uh, a lot better uh, generalizability from learning the simpler form, right? So in the end, why, why did we have the rest of this model around here? Why didn't we just do a direct symbolic regression? Well, the, the point of all this is that having this model around it is really kind of forcing the learning process to, to take into account all of the prior knowledge that we have, and we're only learning the piece that we don't have. And so if you dig into some of these, these papers that we've had on, the, on this topic, you'll see that you know, as you have more and more prior knowledge, the amount, of, the amount of good predictions you're able to get from your data requires less and less data. Yep. Test, test. Yep. Uh, just short question on the last slide. Uh, why? What's the advantage? I see some, but I want to mm -hmm. hear your opinion. What are the is the advantage of using a neural network for that black box that we mm -hmm. don't know, versus just a you know sufficiently generic uh, you know expansion in in you know some of these variables? Yeah. So 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 then you should go. Yeah, you should go back to this and say, okay, well, the universal approximation theorem is about approximating any f. I know other things that approximate any f. A Fourier series approximates any sufficiently continuous F, as long as you have enough terms in there. A Chevy-Chev series, right? Um, a a Legendre polynomial, right? These are other function approximators, right? Now, the, the key the key is that uh, yes, a you know a Fourier series is a representation F of x equals you know what is it a a zero plus a one sine of you know x plus a two sine of x. I mean, I'm just writing the the simple form sine of two x, right? plus dot, 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 right? You know, you can prove with Fourier analysis that this, this is a way to approximate any continuous function if you bring the summation out far enough, right? Um, now, the, the real question that comes into play is what happens in higher dimensions. So, you know, how do you, how do you create a function approximator in higher dimensions? Well, what you'd have to do here is, so if you have a function that is, now let me start to, to erase. So if you have a function that's in higher dimensions, and I think that once you start to write it out, it becomes a lot more clear, right? So how, how would you do the, the Fourier, uh, how would you use a Fourier series to build a universal approximator in two dimensions? You know, f of x, y, well, what you'd have to do is you'd have the a0, then you'd have, uh, well, a0, 0, and we'll have a1, 0, sine of x, and then we have plus a0, 1, sine of y, plus um, a, uh, one, two, sine of x, uh, sine of uh, two y, or yeah, two y plus you know a two uh, two one sine of two x plus you know, uh, or sine uh, sine of y, right? Plus dot 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 dot, right? So if if you notice what's going on here, right? You start having the combination of these terms, right? And so if you have three dimensions, then the number of terms to have for the, for the second part is, you know, it's, uh, it's three, uh, three choose two, right? And then if you have, if you have D dimensions, then in this D, D choose two dimensions, just to be able to get the second uh, expansion term, right? Which, which means that the number of terms that it requires to be, if you do, if you do a, this, this naive, uh, I mean, this is really just, you know, Fourier in X uh, uh, tensor product with uh, Fourier in Y effectively, you know, pseudo notation there, but it's a it's a tensor product of, of universal approximators. This will always give you something that is uh, that has requires exponentially many terms with respect to the dimension that you're choosing. Right. Um, and so if you start going to higher and higher dimensions, you say, I want to learn a function of 20 equations. Right. Very quickly, it starts to say, well, if you want to have more than a quadratic polynomial in 20 dimensions, you know, you need 800 parameters, if I remember correctly, right? If you want to have the, the, the if you want to have a cubic polynomial, you're into like the tens of thousands of parameters. It's just the, the scaling of it is just completely off because you have this exponential scaling, right? Um, and so neural networks are a universal function approximator that overcomes cursor dimensionality. And there's ways to be able to formally prove that the number of parameters that are required in order to go to higher dimensions scales polynomially instead of, uh, instead of exponentially. 
And that's the key there, right? But yeah, so in, in a lot of the things that we do in SciML, we have other universal function approximators that we do use in these lower dimensional cases, but really the, the core idea of it, you're using a function approximator, the different, different types of function approximators might be appropriate in different situations. But then the, 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 key, the key there in the end is, you know, you know, it, you know, you choose the right function approximator to have the minimal parameterized form uh, in, in, in any situation. But the general the general idea is that you write down a model where you know some things and where you don't know some things. And you use that to be able to fit your your function approximator and where it's now a, a function approximator that's only approximating. You know, it's only using the data to approximate the things that you didn't know. Right. And from that, you can do things like, you know, do the symbolic regression and have it spit out a mathematical model, which is, this is our best guess for how we would have auto-completed our model, given the data that we have and given our prior scientific knowledge, right? And so this is, this is then, this is then a, a general form and I'll, I'll get the code set up for, for showing off this, this example here. This is an example that we now have as a, not, not just within you know, these, these notebooks, this is one of the examples we now have within the SciML documentation of showing this in, in practice, right? So um, a, a group of Julia developers did use this on a binary black hole system. And just as a, as a nice uh, exemplary example, where what they show is effectively, you know, assume that you know, assume that you know Newtonian mechanics, right? So this is new, no, Newtonian mechanics in a rotating frame. And you want to learn the motion or the equations of motion for a binary black hole system, right? You have these measurements from a binary black hole system. That's what uh, LIGO detected with gravitational waves back in, what was it, in like 2018, well, 2013. I guess it was a while ago at this point, but it feels still new. Um, but, you know, the, the, so for example, so you have this binary black hole system. You assume that you have, uh, you assume that everything's Newtonian mechanics. And you go, well, you know, there's this guy, Einstein. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he said that Newton, Newton was wrong, right? So let's see if Newton's actually wrong. So let's add these things on here that says, you know, there should be extra terms in our equations of motion. And let's learn those, those extra terms of the equation of motion and extrapolate out from it, right? Um, and you can see this, the, the data that is trained on are these black data points. Uh, the, the true waveform, you know, so the, the, the data of the waveform in the future is in blue. The data of that is the predicted waveform is in orange. And you can see from a very small amount of data, it's able to learn a fairly complex time series, right? And this is the key, right? The reason is because, you know, uh, relativity is... I mean, it gives you a very, it gives you very different dynamics, right? So the dynamics of Newtonian mechanics for a two-body system is an ellipsoid, while the dynamics from the uh, from the two-body solution in relativity is a lysergy pattern, right? But in a dynamical sense, it's actually a small perturbation. It's just a small perturbation to the equations that causes that difference. And so by writing down that, hey, we know most of the, we know most of the physics, there's just some relativist correction here, um, then it's able to learn from a relatively small amount of data how to do a, quite, a, quite a nice prediction, right? Um, and we do this in, in a lot of scenarios. So here, for example, is a scenario where it's modeling a, a chemical reactor system. And so with this chemical reactor system, you have a, a, you have a chemical reactor, uh, so you have this chemical that's bound to the to to you know the, this this plate essentially, and you're flowing another chemical over it. So how how would you model that? Well, it's a partial differential equation where you have a diffusion invection process, right? That's the so so that first process there is this this chemical that's flowing over over the the, the reactor, and then you have another a chemical. So you have a C, which is the concentration of a chemical at every point, and then you have Q, which is this this chemical at at a, at a single point, right? Um, and as you and so what you have then is you have some chemical reaction going on between them, and so you have a a, a, a reaction term, a nonlinear reaction term that you're trying to learn, right? So if you think if you think about this setup, um, let me let me do like a draw like a little picture here. So if you if you think about this setup, right? What what I have essentially is I have C of t, which at every single time point, it's this like distribution. And this distribution is, is a chemical that's moving, right? Um, and then I have this, this q of t, which is just, uh, this is just a time series where at given points t is going up in value or down in value, right? And, and what it is, you know, it's this, I kind of have this, you know, I'm flowing, I'm flowing this chemical c through, I'm flowing this chemical C through and it's interacting with this Q thing. And, and then that, this is what this diffusion and vection equation is modeling, right? 
And for this, and for this chemical that I'm flowing through, I know the properties of its diffusion and, and infection because I'm, I'm the one that's pushing the chemical through. So I know a lot of, I know a lot about that property. What I don't know is I don't know its chemical reaction. I don't, I don't know what's actually going on when I put Q and C together. And so this is what I put as a, as a, as a neural network here, right? And now if, if you notice by construction, right? By construction of this, I have just a two dimensional function. Just how, how, do, how does this thing interact? Like what's the concentration of, of the chemical A? What's the concentration of the chemical B? And what is the reaction rate between them? You know, what is it, what is it causing? That's the only thing that I need to know. It's an R2 to R2 function. And if I can learn that R2 to R2 function, then I can know everything about this entire system. I can know all this dynamics. And so, you know, even though the, the, the data that I have is spatiotemporal, right? You know, I have, I have data points of, you know, this, this thing at time, you know, this is at time T1, and then at time Tn, you know, I have, you know, all these data points, right? So this is something that I have, of, of, you know, you can think about it as I have this very high dimensional spatiotemporal data, but all I want to do is I want to be able to, to learn at this point, you know, at this point right here with this, uh, with this piece, how much were they, uh, how much was the chemical reaction? How much was the chemical react? And if I could learn that one function, then all of this data collapses into to being something that's useful, right? And so that's really the key. In, in the way that you specify this at first, right? You know, if you're just to say, hey, you know, I have, I have some of this data and predict the future, right? You, you, you look at this blue curve, you know, the training data here, it's not, that's a time series that you have to learn, learn on. And if you're just to do machine learning, you just say, ah, uh, let's learn a function and then just, you know, let's, let's see what the function in the future is going to be. You absolutely would not have enough information to get this correct. But if you look at what we get here, you get that, you know, the data points are the squares and the, the prediction is the, is the dashed line going through it. It's almost a pretty good, I mean, it's a pretty perfect prediction, right? But the reason for that is because, you know, we've turned this problem from, hey, learn from that time series how to predict it into, hey, it's a model of this chemical you know, reaction structure. Tell me what that R2 to R2 function is. If you learn that ANN neural network right there, that R2 to R2 function, if you find the theta that makes this thing, uh, that makes this thing work, then I'll be able to tell you everything about the, the solution, the, the future of this model, right? And not only that, but we have a whole bunch of data because we have that data at every point in time, you know, every point in time, every point in space is another piece of data. So this transformation is a transformation that makes it a lot more data filled. And after you do this process of learning the function, you know, what you can do is you can say, okay, what function did it actually learn? Now, you don't necessarily always recover the exact same true kinetics that you had in the first place, but you learn an approximating function Right. And so here what we're able to show is that, you know, the learned kinetics that you get out of a, a out of a symbolic regression, if you actually do the Taylor series expansion of it and your original true uh, true kinetics, what you see is that these functions are pretty much uh, line on line. So so in this case, what in order to be able to create that plot, what we did was we said, OK, in the case of non real data. So, you know, in, in, in the case where we were testing out whether the methods work, let's put a function that we know. Uh, in, there for the neural network and see if we can recover it, right? And what we and what we see is that you know, like the function that we put there, we don't necessarily recover it, but we recover a function that is pretty much precisely acting like that original function. In which case, we can then read off. You know, if you're someone who does uh, work with chemical reactions, you can start to say, well, you know, this function means that the uh, you know, there's no interactions between Q star and Q, whereas this one has a quad oh, the, the, that has some kind of mass actually kinetics there. So you, you could say. You know, it very clearly from the functions that you're learning, whether they're reacting or not reacting and these other high level pieces of information, right? But that's really the key here, right? It's, it's, a, it's a form of learning where you're imposing all of your prior physical and chemical knowledge in order to then use the data that you have to learn only the things you don't know. And this is a nice example. So, you know, I, I mentioned that you know, I have a position at MIT, but also um, at, I'm at Julia Hub, where we do this, a lot of this work industrially. So this is, this is something that we did with uh, the Williams Racing Team. Um, so with the Williams Racing Team, what we, uh, what we did was we looked at this problem of the speed over ground sensor. So for the speed over ground sensor, you have this, uh, you have this sensor that is basically measuring, you know, the, the movement of the ground underneath it. And what you want to know is that as you drive around the track, 
you want to be able to know what is the orientation of the car, right? So why is this used? Well, when, when you're actually running, uh, when they're actually driving around the track during race time, they're, you know, they're, they're wearing a headset, right? And someone on the headset is telling them, oh, hey, you know, you're, you're not taking this turn optimally. You keep on taking it about five degrees uh, too, too narrow. You know, next time around, you know, do, do this a bit wider, right? How do they actually, how does the person on the race computer know this information? Well, they're actually getting data from the sensors on the car. But in order to get the, you know, in order for the sensor to be useful, given that there's a lot of difficult physics here, for example, the slippage of the tires on the ground, in order for this data to be useful, you have to calibrate that sensor to be able to act correctly, right? And so you can just, you know, drive a car around a racetrack and, you know, this racetrack, you can have full GPS and everything and know the full orientation of the car. So on your test track, you, you, you calibrate the sensor. And what they did was they did this with just a Gaussian process. And, and what you see there on the right, this is the, the original Python, uh, it was a PyTorch model with a Gaussian process, right? Um, the, the true orientation of the car is the yellow underneath. The orientation predicted by the Gaussian process is what's on top. And this is what I like to call the chat GPT of physics, right? Um, you know, is like, just look at it. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, when, when, if you use chat GPT before, you know what I mean, right? Just sometimes it can make something up, right? You know, it's generally in the right direction, but it also makes a lot of crap up, right? Um, and, and so, you know, if you don't want it to be able to even be allowed to make things up, well, what can you do? Well, you know, instead of actually just learning what is the orientation of the car, you know, sensor data in, orientation of the car goes out. What if you create a, a, a quick model of the vehicle dynamics? You say, you know, okay, you know, the acceleration, the, the position of the car is related to acceleration and velocity, right? These are things we know in physics, right? Um, so if you write down, you know, some simple equations of motion, and but then you say, okay, the sensor is rel related to this equation, uh, to, to the acceleration, and it's really, well, it's related to the velocity measurement, but it's not exactly because it has some, some issues. So let's make sure that this, this uh, neural network is predicting this, this interaction here, right? Um, then what you get here is, is a scientific machine learning version on the left, which has some, you know, basic model of, 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 of physics essentially encoded, um, and you can see that, you know, from the same data, right, this is the same data, it's able to make a much better prediction just by having some, I mean, when I tell you that this is a crude physical model, it's like the most crude physical model. It's just basically a linear system, essentially. Um, I can't go into a bunch of details, but it's a very crude vehicle dynamics model that is able to then uh, use the same exact data to give much better predictions, right? And so this, this is basically telling you that, you know, if, if you do know something, don't throw it away. Use every little bit that you know and just help with the the the, the fitting of these of these systems, right? Now I give a, bu a bunch of other talks just about scientific machine learning. I don't want to kind of be here forever, and so I will say that if you want to go and uh, there there are some talks that I have on YouTube that go into you know a lot of these different examples of you know how do you, how is it being used on earthquake safe buildings and you know how, uh, all these other kind of case studies. So if you want to see more on these applications, uh, go go to the go to some of these other videos. What uh, basically at this point, I'm gonna say scientific machine learning essentially works. We have a lot of nice proof points for it, but how do you actually do this? Like, so if you want, if you're a scientist and you actually wanna start making use of these ideas for your own systems, how do you do it? And what are the difficulties with doing it, right? And the first question that you have to ask in the how part is, does doing such methods require differentiation of the simulator? Cause ha, huh, like, okay. Let, let, let's let's go into this in detail because maybe this question doesn't even make sense yet. So let's let's look at a case here. So uh, this is a case that we we're working on with uh, some of the folks from the Klima project, where what goes on in in a climate model is well, the base of a climate model is that the ocean's pretty big. I don't know if you've heard about that yet, right? But it, but and so you can't really just model the entire ocean. What you do is you chop it up into little ocean blocks, and in these ocean blocks. You know, you 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 essentially they need to be doing Navier-Stokes equation. Like Navier-Stokes equation is this three-dimensional partial differential equation, which you've probably heard is like one of these very difficult ones to solve. Computational fluid dynamics, right? If every climate model had to actually do computational fluid dynamics at every single part of the ocean for the whole world, you know, for many many years, it, it's never it's you you never finish the computation. So what do you actually do in practice? Well, what you do is you approximate a block of ocean by a one-dimensional partial differential equation that is the average heat flowing up and down. So, you know, what is the average heat of this slice? How is it moving up and down? And what, what, is, what is this average heat uh, over time, right? 
So can I approximate this three-dimensional Boston has approximated Navier-Stokes equation by one-dimensional partial differential equation? This is like the, the core of what's known as the ocean parameterization problem. And if you do the, the normal physics thing, you know, you say, okay, I write, I write, I do a Taylor series expansion, I have my first terms, and everything that's greater than the first term is close enough to zero, so let's make it zero, right? Then you have this equation, which is everything without the neural network, right? But since we know that, you know, since we know from our derivation that there are higher order terms that we just set equal to zero, what we can do is you can say, what if, you know, what if our higher order terms are not zero, right? What if our cows are not spherical, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, if you do this, now it might be hard to actually write down, you know, all these extra equations. In fact, in this case, you can't do it. It would require infinitely many one-dimensional PDEs to, to do this, right? But what you can say is that there are some terms that we that we did not write down. And so let's capture that in a neural network, right? There's there's some there's some extra functions in our series. It's plus something. Uh, how do we write down something? Something is neural network, right? So there we go. We have we have a way to represent that we have. You know, we've done our physics, you know, but instead of doing it the, the textbook way of just doing it to first order, this is first order plus something extra. And what we can do is we can say, well, if, if, if we want this model to be correct, it should match the behavior of the three of the three dimensional model, right? It should be able to run Navier-Stokes equation in three dimensions. And the way that the heat is moving up and down, the, the solution to this model should give me the same thing. So that, that then gives us a data set to be able to learn what should that neural network be such that we are now capturing, uh, the, the, such that my approximation equation is the right thing, right? So now how do I actually train this neural network? That's, I have not, I've, told, I've shown you like, you know, six cases of neural networks and I told you absolutely nothing about how you train them, right? So how do I train this to this guy? Well, uh, you know, I want this, I want this capital T to be, to be the average heat flow or the average heat in one of these, in one of these horizontal spaces, right? Um, so the average change, the change in the average heat over time, well, I can, I can approximate the average heat of a change of heat over time, right? I can go to this, I can go to my three-dimensional simulator and I can say, okay, you know, what is the average heat in this green slice right here? How does it changing over time? I can take the first differences up. I can take the first differences down. I could create a data set that is, you know, this average change of heat over time, right? I can create a data set for this thing. And you know, I, can, I can build this operator. This operator ends up being a matrix. I can invert this matrix, et cetera, et cetera. I can build a data set then that is, what is the average change in heat over time? And what is my prediction of what it should be given my model and given your current values of the, of the, of the, of the temperature? And then uh, the neural network should just be that residual there, right? You minus everything out. You get a you get a data set that is, you know, here's my current average heat. Here is my here's my residual term, and I can train a neural network input output to match that data set, right? And I can so I train this neural network to be to be on this data set, and I stick it into and I stick it into uh, this this PDE, uh, put it in a PDE solver. I solve the PDE, and this is what I get. And the lines don't look, I mean, like the other, the other animations that I showed you looked a lot nicer and this one just doesn't look as good, right? In fact, it has a very, it has a very specific behavior here where at the top you have this, this, this divergence in the solution. It's just growing and growing over time, right? So why is that happening? What, what's going, what's gone wrong here? Well, there's two ways to understand what's gone wrong. The first thing which shows up, uh, uh, the first thing is that what I described to you, right? That we build a data set here, we build a data set here, and we train a neural network to be able to, to match our residual and then we stick it into our simulator. Well, what if our simulator is not perfect, right? Our simulator, right? If, if you know, when you write down something that's matching continuous equations, you, ha you have to choose a delta T, you have to choose all these properties, right? There's numerical errors, everything else is in here and nothing, you, in, in theory, your neural network actually has to take into account these pieces. You've taken into account none of that. And so, of course, it's not going to be able to match your, 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 your data so well in the end because we haven't really given it the right information, right? There's another way to understand this as well, which is, you know, and I know a lot of people here probably know at least a little bit of control theory because of using it within a experimental context, right? What, we, what we've essentially done here with the neural network is we said, we know that our derivative is wrong. So let's put, it, let's put a controller here, a neural network, and let's train it to control the derivative to be correct. And if we only train, if we only control the derivative, what happens? Well, you get a drift, right? That's your that's your standard control theory. So if if you're talking to the control theorist and you say, "I got this drift because I only controlled the derivative," what will they tell you to do? 
I'm like, oh, well, okay, have you heard of a PID controller, right? Well, the reason why you have PI and also D is because you need to control things like the integral in order to make sure you don't have this drift. So what happens if we control the, the, the integral, right? So this is, this is then a different way to look at it, where now what we do is we have this equation, right? So this is our equation for our prediction of the average, temp the average temperature at a slice at every point in time. And our, and our loss function, the way that we're going to train the neural network is we solve this PDE. Um, we solve this PDE with given neural network parameters. And then we compare it to the temperature data, right? Instead of the derivative temperature data, we go to this temperature data and we say, what is the temperature of this slice? What is the temperature of this slice? And we compare it on the temperatures, right? And so instead of using the derivative, instead of controlling the derivative to be contract correct, we start controlling the integral to be correct. And we, when we do that, you get about two to three orders of magnitude better predictions. And so this is what we've been doing on all these examples, where instead of trying to create a data set and train it outside the simulator, we actually train it with a simulation process as part of the loss function, right? The simulator is part of the loss function because the loss function says, solve this, solve this PDE with the neural network inside of it as part of your loss function. Now, what, what is that? What, what difficulty does that cause us? Well, this, this means that our entire simulation process, not just you know, the neural network, but our entire simulation process is now part of the loss function. So we need to be able to differentiate that if we want to do gradient descent, right? So in order to do gradient descent of this loss function, I need to be able to calculate the, the derivative of, this, of the, the solution to the PDE with respect to the neural network parameters. And that's how we get to differentiable simulation. So, you know, so as a quick recap here, you know, where, where are we at? Well, scientific machine learning is this idea that we could just stick neural networks inside of models and simulators and use that to kind of automatically discover the part of the simulator that we don't know. But in order to actually do that, we need to extend everything that we do with backpropagation, right? Backpropagation needs to not just work on the neural network code. Now it also needs to work on our entire simulator code, whatever simulator we stuck the neural network in. And so you need to make sure that you can calculate gradients of potentially anything if you want to be able to do this, which is what brings us to differentiation of solvers and automatic differentiation. So there, there, uh, so a lot of times when you see people talk about like, oh, you know, how do you differentiate these, these difficult equations? So if you have an equation solver that just shows up inside of your, inside of your code and you want to differentiate the equation solver, a lot of people show this kind of graphic where they say, okay, you solve the ODE forwards and you solve the ODE backwards. And you know, this gives you this gives you something where magically a derivative pops out, right? What I want to show you is A, that's not a good idea, and B is it's also kind of like a high-level idea. So um let, let's let's actually let's actually dig into this and, and see. Is that a good way to do it? Is it a bad way to do it? Or how how do you actually do this? So now we hit the fun part. So there, basically any equation solver you can do this on, right? So I, I want to just kind of emphasize that what I'm showing a lot of these examples on are, are ODEs and PDEs today because, you know, there's a lot of physics which is written in ODEs and PDEs. But basically everything that it has an equation solver, you can do, you can essentially differentiate the equation solver in a, in a si similar way. And so there's a lot of patterns that will come out of this. I'm only going to focus on ODEs and PDs because of time, but I do have a bunch of course notes that goes into all the other cases as well. Um, but I mean, you know, for example, so if you're doing like density functional theory calculations, well, that has a nonlinear solve inside of it. So how do you differentiate Newton's method? You know, and all, all these kinds of cases come up. In fact, what Garov talked about earlier today with a stochastic AD, that was developed for differentiating stochastic simulators itself. But, you know, let's let's go through the process of actually looking at you know, at a high level, without automatic differentiation, what it what is the derivative of a simulation process, right? So, well, first of all, what is a simulation process? A simulation in this case, we're going to say is an ODE. So it's u prime equals f of u p t. You know, with some uh, u of zero equals u zero, right? So this is my simulation process. I have some ODE that I'm solving from from a from a time zero, right? And now, what? So, what is a loss function on this thing? Well, I mean, a, u of t is something that's continuous. So, in general, the loss function is some function that I'm going to say is, you know, the loss function. This is some g of uh, of u p 
right? Which is the integral of a little g of u p t uh, d t, right? What do I mean by this little g? Well, this is like this uh, this this cost here, right? So this is a you know this is like a little g of u p t. So there's at every single point in time there's there's a, there's a cost, right? So for example, if I want if I my cost might be oh I want the, I want the trajectory of the ball to be going like this, but it goes like this instead, right? So at every infinitesimal point, I say oh there's there's a there's a cost with respect to the ball not being at the spot I want it to be at, and my total cost is I integrate over all the costs, right? Now, okay, if you only have data points that you want to be evaluating it out, you could change this to have direct delta functions, but Doing it in the continuous form makes the makes the math easier, so we'll do that today. And you can go to the lecture notes for all the extra details. But okay, so let's 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 go on let's go on to this. Okay, so let's let's do a nice mathematician trick here. Um, the mathematician's trick is I want to make this thing called i of of u p, um, which is equal to uh, g of p minus the integral of uh, lambda star, which I will not define yet, we'll see why, u prime equal, minus f of u p t uh, dt. So what is, what is this equal to? Zero, yeah, because u, u prime equals f. Right, so you know this again. This is your this is your standard thing in a math class. I'm gonna I'm gonna add zero, and then it's gonna be really useful by the end of the class. Um, so so okay. So what am I gonna do here, right? So what I really want to know is I want to know what is the derivative of my loss function with respect to the parameters, right? Which just so happens to be equal to the derivative of this i thing with respect to parameters, because because this is zero, right? So you know if I could add zero all I want and take derivatives, it's gonna be the same thing. And now this is going to be equal to da da da. Now let's actually write this out for clarity. Uh, t uh, t. Uh, so okay. So what 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 do we actually have here? Um, so yeah. So so what what I end up what? Uh, let, let me just write out one of these pieces, and then we can, we can we'll be on the same page, right? So what what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm saying this is d d p of the integral of g of u p t, right? dt and uh you know because because i'm not going to be a good mathematician today i'm going to say well let's uh let's swap these these limits right you have to say you know okay if u is sufficiently different okay we can swap these limits right under under sufficiently nice uh, assumptions um and after we swap these limits uh what is this going to be well remember that the solution the solution to this ode is actually a function of our parameters, right? If we change the parameters of our model, if we change the, the, the gravitational constant, then the planets will be in different places, right? The, the solution to our model is actually a function of, of the parameters. It's kind of implicit. We don't always say it, but it's, it's in there, right? But if you do that, then that means you need to make sure that you do, you know, dg, uh, dp, you need to do this with respect to the chain rule, which is a, you know, a partial g, uh, partial p, plus a uh, partial g, uh, partial um, partial u, d, u, d, p, right? That's, that's the, this is the, the chain rule applied to this function that, it, that is, you know, where uh, both this argument is a function of p, well, that's, and then also this argument is a function of p, and we expand out the chain rule, right? Now, I do, I do the, this, uh, this other way of writing it, where I just say this, uh, this right here is g sub p plus uh, g sub u, uh, d, u, d, p, Right. This this uh, little this this little uh, subscript here is just it's just denoting uh, that is a partial derivative. Right. So that is g sub uh, g, partial of g with respect to p plus partial of g with respect to u times s, where s is the sensitivity of the model, which is the amount that the model's output changes when you change your parameters. You'll see that it's going to show up in multiple places. So okay. So that's one term. In, you know. The, the the next term uh, exercise is left to the reader, but it's just another application of the chain rule, right? Um, so okay, so that's how we that's how we get the expression there. And now I want to do something a bit fancy. Um, what I want to do is I want to gather all the terms with s. So if I want to gather all the terms with s, well, what I need to do is I need to turn this s prime into a, into an s. So if you if you ever have a derivative inside of your integral and you want to turn it into a, and you want to turn it into something that doesn't have a derivative, how do you do that? 
It rhymes with Bindigration by Barts. <laughs> Yeah, integration by parts, exactly. You know, so okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do integration by parts, right? So I say, you know, if you remember your integration by parts formula, it's integral of u dv equals u v evaluated at the boundary um plus uh plus uh v integral of v d u, right? Basically the thing that was a derivative now becomes a thing that's not a derivative. That's that's the that's the way we were gonna make use of this, right? So okay, when, when you do integration by parts, you know, so we, we separate out this one part of the integral, and then we do integration on by parts just on the lamb on the lambda star s prime part, right? And why do we do this? Well, we do this in such a way so that way lambda is this this u here, uh, s prime is this dv, and we're using this to be able to get rid of the 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 s prime term, right? And so th this is just your integration by parts formula. So we we do integration by parts on this f on this piece of the equation right here, and then we we add it to the rest of this integral, right? So the rest of this integral right here, this is that integration by parts of this thing. Um, and when you do that, this is the full expression that you get. If you wanna see all the steps written out line by line, you can go to the lecture notes of the SciML course that we ran at MIT. If you search MIT 18337 scientific machine learning, you'll, you'll find the YouTube videos that go through this, right? But here you are. And now I claim that we're done. This is this is actually informative. And you're like, how is that actually informative? Well, okay, it's informative because I haven't actually chosen how to define everything, which is an oxymoron, right? I still have never told you how to define lambda. So let's define it in a very in a very nice way so that we would get a nice result. That's a nice mathematician trick, right? I haven't defined something yet, so let's define it so that way everything's easy. So how can I define it so that way everything's easy? Well. Okay, so let, let's let's first look at this term, right? So lam, lambda star, lambda star uh, of t, s of t, evaluated at the boundary t zero and t t final is equal to lambda star uh, at t zero, s of t zero, plus lambda star at t final, times uh, s uh, at t final. And I claim that this term right here is actually trivial. Does anyone see why that, that term is trivial? Well, we haven't defined lambda yet, so it must be something to do with S. Um, S, remember, is our sensitivity, right? S is the derivative of the model with respect to parameters. So what is the derivative of the model with respect to parameters at the, at the initial time point? How much does our model change when we change our parameters when it's at the when it's at the initial point? Zero. Aha, so that's trivial. Okay. So what's this term? Oh, that's non-trivial. But what wouldn't it be nice if it was trivial? So okay, let's define lambda of t final to be equal to zero. Good. All right, because we never defined this function. Good. Okay. So so this term right here, you know, this this whole term right here is zero. Great. Life is easy. Uh what do we do with this guy? Well, let's define that to be zero, right? So the, well, all that we need to have is that lambda prime or lambda star prime minus, or well, lambda star prime plus this minus that is equal to zero. If that's true, then all those, those that, that, that integral also becomes zero. And that is just a differential equation, right? It is this differential equation right here if this differential equation is true, right? So where did the where did this come from? Well, this is this is making this term zero, right? And what is this term right here? Well, this is just the integrand of that integral, right? This is this this integrand of this integral has a derivative on a lambda, and so it actually is a differential equation, right? So we just say, I want this to be true. I want this to be true because if this is true, that term is zero, that term is zero. And now all I'm left with is this equation right here, that the, deri the derivative of my loss function, uh, ignore, ignore this first term because, uh, well, okay, if, if the sensitivity of your model, uh, if your initial condition is dependent on parameters, that first thing is non-zero. But if your initial condition with respect to your parameters is, you know, if your, if your initial condition is fixed, this term right here is zero, and all you get is dgdp equals some integral of g, lambda, and f. How do you know what lambda is? Well, it's solved by this differential equation. 
And there you go. If you can solve that differential equation, then, then you have the way to calculate the derivative, which let's, let's actually look at what, what this means, right? It's actually, it actually kind of is interesting what, what you get in the end here. Because you know, if you can understand it at a higher level, and it kind of tells you what to expect when you go to a bunch of other simulation cases. So what, what, what you get from here can be drawn as a picture. So what you get from here can be drawn as a picture where here I'm solving this, you know, this U, U of uh, T. And after I solve for U of T, what I do is I start this lambda of T process. I start it at zero and I solve it backwards, right? Because I'm given a final condition, right? It's an initial condition at the final time point. And I can solve this differential equation backwards. But every single point in time, what I need to know is I need to know right here, I need to know the derivative of f with respect to u at this time point. So I need to I need to remember what u was at this time point in order to calculate the derivative of f with respect to that. But as long as I remember what what this u is how this u is calculated, if I remember all of its values in time, then I can define this ODE and I can solve it in reverse, right? So there you go. And then after I do that, I can take the integral of, of this uh, with respect to this, this lambda, and it gives me the derivative of the cost function with respect to lambda, which essentially then means that we can write it as this three-step process. We solve an ODE going forwards, we solve an ODE going in, in reverse, and we throw, slap an integral on that. We can even simplify it a bit more. So, well, okay, so there's one detail of how do you actually remember this value of u going backwards? Right. Well, you, you can you can just you know you can use an ODE solver that gives you out a continuous solution. You can take a bunch of points and then say you're going to build an interpolating polynomial between them. So that way, when you need to have this value of u at every time point, you can grab it. And one thing that you can remember though is that you know numerically, um, if you have u prime equals f of u going forwards, then u prime equals minus f of u going in going in reverse will actually go directly along the same lines as long as uh, as long as you 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 know have that the correct as long as you have this final condition which is equal to the original condition right so you know it's this idea that physics is reversible right um that's a way to be able to write it so you know what, what you could do then is instead of just solving this lambda equation going reverse right so you have lambda prime equals some ode right what you can also do is you can also solve this u prime equals minus f at the same time and so you can solve the system of ODEs. And with the system of ODEs, you'll always know what the value of U is because you're just reconstructing it as you go backwards, right? I know that some of you go, well, what about numerical analysis? Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Um, now, okay, what do you do about this? What, what do you do about that integral? Well, it, you, you can actually use a nice property, right? So uh, let's say we want to calculate, um, let's say we want to calculate F of T DT, right? Well, what we can what we can do is we can define this ODE, which is uh, you know, well let, let's yeah you know, let's what we what we could do is we could define this ODE that is uh, u prime equals f of t, and let's solve it with Euler's method, right? Um, so let's you know let's just write out Euler's method really quickly on this. Oh, actually, I, I don't want to get get in the way of my nice picture here that I got going. So what what does Euler's method look like on here, right? So then you'd have u1 equals u0 plus delta t times f of uh, t0, right? u2 equals uh, u1 plus delta t times f of t1. Let's substitute this in, right? That means that u2 equals um, u2 equals uh, u0 plus, uh, let's see. Yeah, u, u2 equals u0 plus delta t times f of t0 plus f of t1, right? And so you can start to see the pattern that un equals u0 plus delta t times uh, delta t times the summation of f of t0 plus f of t1 plus dot 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 to f of tn, right? Does everyone, does everyone kind of see that, right? So if you, if you just write down Euler's method on this ODE, you get un equals the initial condition plus delta t times the f the times f evaluated at each of these time points 
That's just Euler's method written out to n steps. But does anyone see how to make the uh, how to make this thing? So this Euler approximation of this ODE. Does anyone see how to make this approximate the the integral? Delta t, right? So this is this is an area, right? This is like you know a delta t, and then you have uh, f of t, right? f of ti, and you have all these different points where you're adding together f of ti. This is this is effectively a trapezoidal rule, right? But it's not the trapezoidal rule because you have this guy, right? So if you want this to be the trapezoidal rule, what does u zero have to be equal to? Zero. So, so if you want, so you know, more like this is a kind of a side story. If you want to solve, if you want to solve an explicit integral using an ODE solver, what you do is you just stick that integrand into the ODE solver as the function, and you have a, a zero initial condition. And what will come out of it is the the thing that comes out at the end of your of your ODE solver is the solution to that integral. It's just a nice trick, right? But what this nice trick means is that we can also do this, you know, mu prime where mu of, of capital T is equal to zero. So mu at the last time point is also starting out as zero. And we have this pseudo ODE going re in reverse, which is the integrand of the thing that we want to integrate. And then what we have right here, what, what we get as mu of zero, does anyone see what mu of zero is equal to if we do this? Well, mu, mu is zero is equal to the integral of the thing that we want in here. So mu is zero, what, what's this quantity that we wanted it to be? Aha, it's D, G, D, P. D, J, D capital G, D, D, P. And there you go. So what is the derivative of our solution with respect to parameters? Well, we solve this, we, so, we do our simulator going forwards, and then we do some augmented simulation process going backwards. And then one of the values of that augmented simulation process, and when we do it backwards, just happens to be equal to the derivative of the, the simulation with respect to parameters. And this ends up being a, a pretty general property, right? So what is the, you know, how would you differentiate a simulator? Well, generally, you know, there's two ways to do it. It's either to do forward differentiation or reverse differentiation. This is reverse differentiation of an ODE solver. It just happens to be that Reverse differentiation of an ODE solver is equivalent to solving an ODE, uh, you know, an, uh, solving through forwards with an ODE and then solving an ODE backwards. D you know, and you, you could find that, you know, oh, if you want to take the derivative of an agent-based model, well, a derivative of an agent-based model is a new agent-based model where you run it either forwards or backwards where you do the derivative. Like, it's a very general property that if you have a simulator, there's an augmented way to run that simulator that gives you the derivatives of your original simulation. Cool. Can this go wrong? <laughs> Mathematically, everything's correct, which means that if you if you put it into your computer, it should work the first time, right? So it turns out that this that what I just basically described is uh, unconditionally unstable. Um, and, and and so uh, what what do I mean by that? Well, so this is there's something that you can do, which is the advection equation. So how many people here know the advection equation in upwinding? Okay, so it's not it's not a it's not a PDE crowd. Yeah, so so. Here, uh, so there's this this equation called the advection equation, right? So you you, you take your your equation, and then you add every delta x, right? You say that this is going to be, you know, this this is u, um, you know, this is u zero of t, this is u one of t. So you 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 discretize your PDE by saying instead of trying to solve something that's continuous, I'm going to ask what is the solution um, at at these different spatial points, right? And and so this PDE, you can turn it into a set of ODEs, just saying, okay, what is the value? Uh, uh, what is the value of u at this time point? You know, what uh, what is the value right here in space at this time point? What's the value right here in space at this time point? And every single point in space is a is a is it has a differential equation associated for how it's changing its value over time, right? And there's two ways to be able to go from the continuous form to the discrete form. You can either you know, so so here's the thing, right? So it's a uh, it's du dt equals you know a du dx, right? And so this du dx, well, do you want to do it by 
Do you want to do it by the forward one minus the the uh, this one divided by dx, delta x, or do you want to do it by the by the the one behind you minus here divided by delta x? Right. Both ways are ways to approximate the first derivative. And so, can you just choose? Uh, can you just choose ar arbitrarily which which way you're going to do this differentiation? Right. So there's two different ways to be able to write this down, so that way you get an ODE. But I, I'll, I'll tell you now that the the analytical solution to this PDE is it's just a wave moving forwards. So it's just this this wave moving to the right. And so if you write if you write down this discretization where you say, okay, you know my uh, for this point right here, I'm going to look to the right, and I'm going to use that to tell me what the derivative is in uh, right now. Right, and then the other way of doing this is you look to the left, and you and you use the value from the left to tell you what the derivative is. Which, given that the wave is going to the right, which one do you think is is the right way to do this? It's hard to look in the future. Yeah, if if your if your update equation is never looking to the left, and the value that you're supposed to be at the future, like if you just look at one, right, the value at one is the value at zero for some time in the past, right? It's just translating across. So if at, if at one, you're never looking to the left to tell you what its value used to be, there's no way you're going to solve this effectively, right? So this is, you know, there's a mathematical way to be able to say then that if you that if you are using the version of this that is discrete, uh, that is taking the derivative by looking to the right, you have, you're unconditionally unstable. So for any delta x, uh, this, this, this way of writing down this discretization always gives you the infinite. So you have to look in the direction where the wave is coming from. So this is known as the, the upwinding discretization. Now let's think about what that means in terms of what we just did, right? You know, what, what, what we just did with all this stuff is we said, okay, we solve an ODE going forwards, we solve an ODE going in reverse, right? So let's say you chose, you know, like, oh, I need to use looking at to the left in order to make sure that the way that I write down this ODE, the way I discretize this model is going to give me the correct answer when I, when I solve it going forwards, right? When I, when I then choose to reverse my model, the wave is going in the other direction. And so therefore you had to choose the other way of writing down your ODE. Otherwise, otherwise the reverse direction is unconditionally unstable. So you end up in this, in this piece where if you, choose, if you choose this way of writing your ODE, then your simulator is correct, but your gradient is infinite. If you choose this way of doing it, then your, your, uh, then your simulator goes to infinity no matter what delta x you choose, but your gradients are in theory correct. <laughs> so, okay, so what this means is that it's very, just because you did the math correctly for how to calculate the derivative of your simulator doesn't mean that it's actually a convergent method. You know, like when you write down a simulation process, you have to prove, does this actually converge? You know, when delta t goes to zero, is this matching the true property in nature that I'm trying to match? And, you know, when, when, you're, when you're doing this adjoint process, you're generating a new set of equations from your original set of equations. And you do need to ask the question, this new set of equations that I wrote down, is it actually numerically stable? Because it's, and there is a potential possibility that the equations that you're generating and the way that you're generating it are not stable. And so the reason, so the reason why I point this out is because this actually comes from the Neural Ordinary Differential Equations paper. So this is a machine learning paper that very confidently said, oh yeah, you solve this going forwards and you solve this going in reverse and you get your derivatives, right? If you notice, this is that same augmented equation that we derived, but it turns out there's a lot of equations for which that does not work out. And so we actually had a whole set of uh, papers that are talking about, you know, oh, if you have this going in forwards, then you have to look at the Lipschitz constant of your ODE, and the Lipschitz constant of your ODE tells you that, you know, you can get up to, you know, when your Lipschitz constant's bigger than 50, you can get up to 10 to the 10th error when you reverse it and all these properties. And so it becomes a very numerical thing. I don't want to go into all the details there, but the, the, co the core idea is that the derivative of a simulator is a simulator itself, and you really need to be looking at the properties of the simulator that's generated in order to know whether your derivatives are actually going to work out in practice. But okay, you know, you've heard that, that there's this thing called automatic differentiation. So how is automatic differentiation similar to this? How is it different from this? And what does that tell us about automatic differentiation on difficult codes? And um, I want to kind of go through this. So, so I give this example on, on, on discourse. Um, but let me, I, what I want to do here is I want to write out all the steps of automatic differentiation on one problem 
so that way we all understand it in the same way. So let's start by saying what is symbolic differentiation, right? Because we want to we want to understand how is symbolic mathematics different from automatic differentiation. So symbolic symbolically, what we what we do is we represent a function mathematically, and then we differentiate it. So here I'm using Julia symbolics. I create a symbolic variable x, and here's my function, right? My function is make out equal to one, and then I multiply out. Uh, to the x to the ith power, we do that in a loop, and I and I have out right. And now I say, okay, let's let's evaluate sine of f of x, right? This is some this is some function, you know, it's a composition of different functions. And you know, if you actually sit th at this and stare at it long enough, you'll be able to see like, oh, this is actually the sine of f of x is actually the same thing as sine of x of fifteen, right? And if you if you evaluate this with with symbolics, what it will do is it'll generate this mathematical expression. Symbolics will say the mathematical expression that is equivalent to this function is sine of x to the 15th, right? So that's how symbolic computing works. It can trace through these, these, compu these computational functions and give you the mathematical way of writing down that function. Now, once you, have a, uh, once you have a symbolic representation of the function, you can say, well, what's the derivative of sine of f of x with respect to x? And you go, okay, that's 15x to the 14th cosine of x to the 15th. Why is, that, why is that the derivative? Well, because this thing that you wrote down is equal to sine of x to the 15th. So therefore, that's its derivative, right? So this is how symbolic differentiation works. So question, why do we not do symbolic differentiation everywhere? Well, let, let me write down a, a slightly different function, right? So this function, it, it, this function is nice, but I can do a very small change to the function, and then this is no longer nice. So all I do here is instead of just doing x to the ith power, I'm not, you know, instead of doing powers, I'm just going to say out equals times equals sine of out, right? This is also another function. It's very easy to write down. It's a small for loop, and I say what is f uh, sine of f of x? And this thing goes on and on and on and on and on, right? What is the derivative of this expression? Well, okay, you have to do the chain rule on this whole thing. It, it, take, it would take like, I can't, you know, it takes like five pages just to write down the derivative of this thing, right? So this is the expression growth problem, right? There are some things that are very easy to express as programs, you know, or, or as easy to express as algorithms, which are not easy to express as a single computational, you know, or mathematical function. So what we want to do then is we don't we, we don't want to be able to we don't want to do our derivatives in the space of mathematical functions. We want to do send the way that we think about derivatives to the space of computer programs. So instead of saying, oh, translate this, translate this computer thing to math and then do do derivatives on it, what I want to do is I want to translate derivatives to computer program language. Right? You know, it's just what is the language that I'm computing derivatives on? Instead of computing it in the language of math. I want to compute derivatives in the language of algorithms. And now, let me go step by step to show you exactly how this is working. Right. So, he, he, out of curiosity, here, who here knows uh, uh, the definition of dual numbers for 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 forward mode AD? All right. So it's about about fifty percent. So let, let's let's go into this uh, fast. It's a uh, so what we what we do is we have this dual number d d is equal to x plus you know epsilon epsilon here is not a small number, it's a dimensional signifier. If you, if you think, for example, like complex numbers, it's like i. It's a, what we're really representing here is this is a two-dimensional number. This is a, this is a two-dimensional number. This, there's x, y, you know, there's this x, y here. So d is some two-dimensional number, right? We're calling it epsilon just as it has some nice properties like that, right? So, okay, so we have this two-dimensional number. And what, what we want its properties to be are this, right? We want epsilon squared to be equal to zero, and we want f of uh, f of d to be equal to f of x plus y f prime of x epsilon. Right? Now, why do we want this to be true? Well, it's, it has this nice property that if you have g of f of d, let's just write this down. Right, so if I apply g to this, uh, then I, what I would have is I would have g of f of x, right? Because this is the the primal part, right? This is the x in f of d, and now I'm going to add to it, you know, 
I'm going to add to it this. What, so what is the y in this expression? Well, it is this whole piece. So it's y f prime of x times what is the f prime of x in here? Well, it is going to be this uh, uh, g prime of f of d epsilon, right? So what you can see shows up right here. This is the chain rule. So this is my definition then. My definition is that, uh, that, eps that dual numbers act like this. And what I get out of it is that the, this part ends up acting like the chain rule. And this part notably only acts on the primal, right? This part only acts on the, this F part. So what, what, what ends up happening then is that you have, so this is called the primal. This part is effectively evaluating your, so any program can be thought of as a composition of functions, right? You do function one, then you do function two, you do function three, et cetera, et cetera, until you're done with the program, right? This part of, of the number, right? So your number has two pieces. This part of the number runs exactly like your original program. You know, it, you do F to it, you do G to it, it's going to evaluate exactly the same thing that you computed before. This part is, is at every single step of the way, it's finding out what is the derivative of the function where I'm at and multiplying that derivative to whatever was there before, which ends up being effectively equal to the chain rule. And so from these properties, we actually get something nice out. So from these properties, um, you know, the claim here is that for some arbitrary, for arbitrary uh, f, which is equal to fn composed with dot, 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 f2 composed with f1, right? So if you have an arbitrary, you know, chain of functions, you have the property that f of x plus 1 epsilon is equal to f of x plus f prime of x epsilon. And how do you get that? Well, you just make y equal to 1, right? It actually just falls right out of the definition. But what this means is that you have this property that if you, if you define things so that way you had this dual number, and you just say, you know, I, I, I now have everything, instead of being one-dimensional numbers, I have everything working in terms of two-dimensional numbers, where I define my function to be working on this two-dimensional number like this, I can take an arbitrary program, and I stick in x plus 1 epsilon, and for an arbitrary program, what comes out of it is the original output of the program plus the derivative of that program uh, times epsilon. So I get, I get two numbers out. I get the, the original run of the program and I get its derivative and both things pop out at the same time. So let's actually, let's actually see this in practice. I think when you, when, you, when you do it out on an example, it makes much more sense. So, okay. So in our program right here, well, let's skip over the x e uh, out equals x, that one's trivial. But, so before what we did was we said, okay, we had this, this, you know, so remember what our computation was. It was, uh, you know, it was do sign of out at each time, right? And then, and then multiply to, to, to out. So let's split that up into two steps. The first step is we compute, we compute sign of out, right? Well, now out is this two-dimensional number. It has two parts, right? So what we want to do is we want to define what is, what is sign of out? Well, sign of out is equal to sign of the first part of out plus the second part of out times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. And there you go. So sine of out has now turned into on this two-dimensional number, it turns into sine of out of one, right? That is, you know, that is carrying forward the primal term. Uh, and then the second part of this number is out of two, right? Which is this, this y piece multiplied by the cosine of out of one, right? So this is where uh, some uh, symbolic and automatic differentiation start to look similar, right? In order to write this automatic differentiation library, I will have actually had to write down that the analytical solution to the derivative of sine is cosine, right? And so there is a set of primitives in the library that we've actually predefined how to do, how to do these derivatives. But okay, so so what uh, now out equals out times T TMP? Well, what does this come out to? Well, under the rule that epsilon equals zero, let's write out one of these cases. So x plus y epsilon times v plus w epsilon is equal to uh, xv. Uh, plus uh, x, uh, xw plus yv epsilon plus yw epsilon squared. But we say epsilon squared is equal to zero. 
So this is the number that we get out, right? So notice the same property kind of applies here. The first, the thing without the epsilon is equal to x times v. So it's just the multiplication that, uh, that we would have had if we weren't calculating derivatives. The second piece here is the derivative of the second one times the non-derivative of the first plus the derivative of the, of the first one would times the non-derivative of the second. This is the product rule, right? And so if you write this down here, you have you know, the, the multiplication of the two first terms and then you have the product rule, right? And now, uh, you know, there's, there's one extra step here where, remember, we're calculating sine of f of x, right? So we do, the, we do the same thing there as well. Now, this is rewriting our function now to be working on, on these two-dimensional numbers. And now the key here is that when I say, you know, when I put in to this function, you know, x comma 1, right? When I put into this function x comma 1, what pops out of here is two numbers. First number is, the, is what f of x is. The second number is f prime of x. And now I actually compiled that function, right? So I went, I went back to, to here. I compiled the symbolic derivative solution just to double check. And if you just, if you just double check with the symbolic solution, the derivative of sine of f of x is equal to this right here. So notice that you know, they're not exactly the same because the computational order, there's floating point error, et cetera, et cetera. But this, the second term right here is the derivative, right? So that's what automatic differentiation is doing. That's forward mode automatic differentiation, but that's forward mode automatic differentiation, all the steps of it on one piece of code. So this is, you know, if you wanted to know what, if you did forward diff on your code, this is exactly what it's doing. It is writing out this kind of function using multiple dispatch and is calculating these two pieces. And when you ask it, what is my derivative? It gives you out just the second piece here. Anyone have any questions on automatic differentiation? Last yep. So where are we at now? So we started this by saying scientific machine learning is cool, right? We we get to, to put neural networks inside of our simulators. We could use that to be able to understand the physics that we didn't know. We could use this to be able to uh, extend models, right? But if we want to do this, what do we need to be able to do? Well, we need to be able to calculate derivatives of simulators. So then I showed you a big derivation of that the, the derivative of a simulator is running your simulator in a new way, right? It's running your simulator forwards and then backwards. And that ends up being a pretty general property. But then I showed you this thing called automatic differentiation, where I just slapped down a piece of code, and what came out of that piece of code was a, was a way to calculate the derivative. So what does automatic differentiation of a simulator do? Is it the same thing as the derivatives that we were writing down, right? So I want to I want to investigate that a little bit. So you know, now I, I want to say that there's one caveat here. So with the, the, the derivative that I wrote down before was the reverse mode version of the derivative. So what, what is the forward mode derivative? So let's, let's say we have this simulator again, u prime equals f of u comma p comma t, right? So we, we have this simulator again, and uh, what, what is the, you know, uh, what is the forward mode derivative of the simulation process itself? Well, we can calculate that pretty easily. We take the derivative DDP of both sides of our ODE. DDP, uh, well, this is U prime, DDP of F, right? So you know, this, is, this right here is D, DDP of DU DT. You know, once again, let's be bad mathematicians and let's swap the, let's swap the limits, right? You know, under, under conditions where your ODE is sufficiently, you know, has, is twice differentiable, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But, you know, after, after all that, what you could say that, that this is DDT of DU DP um, is equal to, right? Remember, this is just the chain rule again. Uh, we're going to do, um, you know, the derivative of F with respect to P plus the derivative of F or the partial width of F with respect to U um, and then the derivative of u with respect to p. Remember, that's the same chain rule piece. Notice that this same guy is showing up again. So this is s. This is our sensitivity. And this is ddt. So this is saying that s prime is equal to um, s prime is equal to f sub p plus um, f sub u s. Right. So this is the forward mode derivative. The calculation of, of the is, is much simpler, but it gives us the same idea, right? That the, the, for, the forward mode derivative of an ODE solver is to calculate your, the, the derivative of the solution of the ODE with respect to parameters is itself given by an ODE. 
where if you solve this ODE, then if you solve this ODE, then this tells you how your how your problem is changing, and then that's what you need to be able to calculate your gradients for your for your loss function, right? Um, but you know, how do you actually calculate this? Well, you have to take the, the the Jacobian of f with respect to u. So you need to know what the value of u is. So what you generally would do instead is you would solve this larger ODE u prime s prime equals f of u p t um, uh, f sub p plus f sub u s, right? And this is a system of equations where if you solve them simultaneously, you get the solution out and you get the derivative. Doesn't that sound a lot like the automatic differentiation thing we just did? Well, let's see. Let's see what happens. So, okay. In order to know how automatic differentiation is going to work, let's uh, let's auto diff uh, Euler's method. Right. So let's let's write the, let's do the automatic differentiation transformation, right? The forward mode automatic differentiation on Euler's method and see what we get. So Euler's method for ODE would be U of N plus one is equal to U sub N plus delta T times F of U sub N P comma P comma T sub N, right? This is Euler's update uh, steps. Now assume instead here that U is a dual number. So uh, let U uh, let, let's let u uh, sub n be equal to x sub n plus y sub n epsilon. It's a, it's a dual number now, right? So what, what, what actually happens when we stick this dual number in here? Well, we have uh, x sub n plus 1 plus y sub n plus 1 epsilon. You know, uh, and this is, this is prime, right? Which I'm going to carry this through as just a, uh, well, well, no, no, there's no prime here, yeah. Uh, this is going to be equal to x sub n plus y sub n epsilon plus delta t times f of you know u sub n. Uh, well, let, let me let me just do this piece right. So how do you how do you evaluate f on a dual number? All right. Well, this is going to be f of just the first part, right? X sub n uh, p t n plus f of uh, uh, well, plus uh, the uh, f or the derivative of f with respect to uh, there's not a nice way to write this. Um, well, I'm just going to say f prime, and it, what I mean by prime here is I mean derivative with respect to the first piece, right? Um, so this is x prime of x p t n uh, times y sub n uh, epsilon. Right. So how do how do I do this? Well, this is just what happens when you stick a dual number into f. Right. You you evaluate it. You do it on the primal, and then you do its derivative on the primal times the the y sub n part. Right. But now I have. Let me gather this into two into two sets. Right. So we have you know x sub n plus one plus y sub n plus one epsilon is equal to x sub n plus delta t f of x sub n p tn plus y sub n plus delta t f prime of x sub n comma p comma tn um, uh, da, 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 uh, y sub n epsilon. I believe I did that correct. Right? And so we can actually see, okay, so x sub n plus 1 you know, if if we if we match the terms, right? So we we have you have the 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 primal part and the dual part here. What this is telling you is that the way they calculate x sub n plus one is equal to x n plus delta t f of x n comma p comma t n, and then the way that you calculate y sub n plus one is equal to um, is equal to y sub n plus uh, delta t f of x n f prime of x n p t uh, y n right this is just matching the terms the terms of the epsilon and the term without the epsilon so does anyone see well what what is what is this what is this if we send delta t equal to zero
what is that equation for x actually doing? What does the primal part of automatic differentiation always do? It just solves the equation as though automatic differentiation wasn't happening, right? If you look at this, this is x of n plus 1 equals x of n plus delta t f of x of n. This is Euler's method on x, right? So this is Euler's method solving u prime equals f of u. And then it's carrying along a second thing. The second thing is also an Euler's method, right? It's an Euler's method where now this is the new, you know, if we call this g, right? Then this is the, the, we have some pseudo equation, right? We have some pseudo equation s prime equals g of g of u, where g is equal to f prime comma y, or times y. It just so happens that that's exactly what this is, right? And so, uh, does anyone know why we don't have this term showing up here? Right. So if, if you if you look at this, right, you know, uh, d, uh, the derivative of f with respect to u, that's this first term right here, times s, right? So I'm just saying, oh, here, y, 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 if we just renamed it s, then we have, uh, then, we, then we have this, this exact thing right here, right? This is, um, you know, this is uh, uh, f with com comma u, or the derivative of f with respect to u plus, uh, or times s, right? Yeah, exactly. So the reason why we don't have this term right here in the way that I just derived it is because I didn't say that P was a dual number. If P was a dual number, then you'd also have to split it by P. And that's where that second term comes from. So, aha. Uh -huh. So, so that's why. So we're just assuming that F sub P, uh, the, the partial derivative of F with respect to P is equal to zero because it's a, it's not a dual number. So, so it turns out that if you do automatic differentiation on an ODE solver, what it's doing inside of its primal and its dual parts is it's solving o different ODEs. The, the ODEs that it's solving is exactly the ODEs that you would get from this other the, from this other method. Sounds great, right? So it means that you know if 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 you do this thing of like if, you know you don't actually have to derive derivatives of sim simulators because if you do automatic differentiation with simulator, it's doing the same thing, right? Is it? So again, right? So I, in, in the first case, I, we, you know, we first derived something mathematically and then we took derivatives of it and we said, okay, are there cases where this is mathematically correct but numerically gives you the wrong results? And we showed, yeah, there are cases where the way that we wrote down our derivative is mathematically correct but numerically gives you an infinity. So can I do that with automatic differentiation? Automatic differentiation is floating point accurate, right? You might've heard people tell you that. So I shouldn't be able to do this, right? Well, actually, I only learned that this is possible because, you know, the Julie community is great and we show each other how all of our stuff is broken, right? So someone came up with this example and they, they came to this and said, I'm trying to calculate the derivative of this. I do it with, uh, I do it with this method, right? So the, the ODE solver library has this method written down where, where, you know, no automatic differentiation. It writes down this equation and then it says, okay, I solved this equation. I did this method. I did this method. I got two different results. And then I also do the, I also do the, the adjoint. So the one that I derived by hand and you know, you, you get, you get the, everything and everything has the same results as this one. Automatic differentiation is giving you a different result than from every single other way I know how to calculate this derivative. Why? So it took a while to actually find out, but it's a really fun example because if you ever have someone that tells you automatic differentiation calculates the correct values, oh boy. <laughs> but this, the, I love this example because it's very enlightening for telling you why simulators are an interesting thing to, to mix with di differential equation or with derivatives and machine learning and all that. So. This is this is the part that I find fun. You know, the the most fun part's always when you break things, right? So, what is this example actually doing? What is this example actually doing? Well, in this example, if you play with it, right? So, so you know, this example 
is this uh, you know u prime equals well let, let's do let's do u of one u of one is equal to x right u of two is equal to y right so I'm going to give it better names right so the, the what what the, this is x prime is equal to a times x minus x y and then y prime is equal to minus a times y uh, plus uh, x, y, right? And the parameters are, um, well, the parameters, I think that there's only one parameter. It's a equals to one, right? The extra parameter values are just zeros. And x, zero is equal to one, and y, zero is equal to one. So let's start solving our equation, right? So here we are with, you know, x, x of zero and it's equal to one, right? Now let's stick in the initial condition. So, you know, x prime at time zero is equal to one times one minus one times one, which is equal to zero. Y prime of zero is equal to one times one minus one times one plus one times one, which is equal to zero. So this ODE is actually very easy to solve. It's the constant equation. But if you perturb the parameter a little bit, if you perturb the parameter a little bit, it goes off. So what does that mean? What's actually going on? Well, in order to actually understand what's going on, we have to know what our simulator code is actually doing, right? So let's talk about an adaptive ODE solver, right? So the way that adaptive ODE solver works is, so let's say we're at this point in the solution, it's going to propose a time step, right? So it's going to say, let's take a time step of this large. And what it's going to do is it's going to solve, the, solve it with two so solutions, right? So it's going to use two different ODE solvers effectively in some sense to be able to find out what's in the future. And I'll take the difference between them to be able to calculate what the error is. And if the error is too high, it'll reject and it'll take a smaller time step. So if the error was too high, it'll reject and take a smaller time step. It'll do this process again, see that the error is small enough and accept, right? Now, the key here is how, how does it know how to propose this time step H? Well, it knows how to propose this time step H based off of the error that it's seeing. If it's seeing that every single time it's stepping, the error is very small, you might as well make your time step larger, right? So what's the error that you get with an ODE solver when the solution's constant? Zero. So if you watch what the ODE solver is doing, the first step is kind of small. The next step is kind of bigger. It starts going, oh, hey, this is easy. I'm just going to take gigantic time steps and go all the way to the end, because this is a very easy equation to solve. It's constant, right? But now, remember what we said, right? We have that, you know, we're solving, you know, we have uh, xn plus 1 equals xn plus delta t f of xn, you know, pt. This is the primal. And then you have yn plus 1 equals yn plus delta t uh, vector Jacobian product, um, vector Jacobian product uh, times yn, right? So think about this, right? This is our primal code. This is our primal code. And we're going to choose, you know, stepping based off of this. So we choose how we do time steps based off of uh, based off of only the primal because remember the the primal the primal the way that we calculated the, the ODE automatic differentiation leaves it exactly the same and for this ODE it says take gigantic time steps because this ODE is easy to solve and it's going to carry along our dual numbers and the dual numbers right they're doing this process but this process is actually well this is x prime equals f of f of x and this is uh, y prime equals, you know, f prime of x, y, right? Th this, this other ODE is being solved using the time steps that is appropriate for this ODE right here. But this ODE is actually doing something non-trivial. And so therefore, when you put those two facts together, automatic differentiation is calculating the derivative with using a process that is not actually controlling the the accurate the, the accuracy of the solver on its derivative and so if, when you look at it this is why you get that you know that the original ad has an incorrect solution forward sensitivity is doing something correct 
but we actually corrected this inside of the ODE solver. Can anyone guess how we might have corrected this? Yeah, pretty much. So, so, so the, the, the where the where the where the thing goes wrong is that when we approximate the error, right? We I said, oh, the, the, how big of an error you have tells you how big of time steps you should do, right? So what you have to do is you just have to say my error norm, my error norm is going to be, you know, if if you want to make it so that your way your code runs uh, the same way uh, without automatic differentiation, your error norm would just be the norm of x. But if you do that, it won't be actually controlling the 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 um the the error of this extra process that is carrying around. So you can redefine your norm to say I, every time I take a norm inside of the ODE solver of the error, I can take the norm and I'm going to add the dual numbers to it, which means you no longer have the property. If you do this, you no longer have this is no longer standard automatic differentiation, right? If you automatically differentiate this solver, it will change the steps that it's doing in its original solve, right? But this way that it's changing its steps will force this equation to be correct. In fact, the way the reason why it's forcing the equation to be correct is that if you choose this error norm, it's the, it gives you the exact same thing as as having the ODE solve these equations, right? Because if you actually wrote down those equations by hand yourself, then the error that that is actually getting inside of the adaptivity is to do the air, uh, adaptivity error on the on both the pieces and add it together. So in the end, the ODE, the ODE solver actually has a trick in there. The ODE solver is not actually doing true automatic differentiation. Because if you do true automatic differentiation of an ODE solver, you can get incorrect results. So it has a corrected different, it has a corrected thing. So this is this is actually, if you look at the arguments here, you see internal norm is equal to just the sum, right? This is basically saying, hey, don't use the internal norm that we have that's corrected. If you use the standard way of calculating the norm, you know, ab, uh, square, uh, ab squared, then you get the wrong answer. If you, if, you, if you let it use an internal norm that it has defined, then it does a special thing on dual numbers and it gives you the correct answer. And this is actually something, this is not a property of, you know, the Julia or its automatic differentiation. This is a property of automatic differentiation itself. If you take a code that is a simulator process, um, and you say, oh, you know, let's automatically differentiate it, right? And you, you go to someone's ODE solver, you can write down this example and you can show them, hey, your automatic differentiation is broken, right? And you'll play with their head, right? Because it'll, it'll take a while to figure out. It's like, no, their implementations on, of automatic differentiation is not broken here. This is a property of automatic differentiation that it does not necessarily calculate derivatives correctly when you have some kind of numerical process that's going on. Is something that you really have to keep in mind. Um, yeah. So so so. Um, well, yeah. So so what it what it basically sees is that if you have your initial condition or your parameters be dual numbers, it's defined that the the you know it's def it will define itself to make it so that way the the state will always turn into dual numbers, and then it will ha and it will put this norm in there to be able to correct itself. So. It basically corrects itself so that way it's hard for you. I mean, you really have to go out of your way and redefine the norm in order to make it calculate the wrong thing. But this is an internal library thing, right? Before we added these corrections to make it not act like automatic differentiation, it was incorrect because it was doing automatic differentiation, <laughs> which is very, we want to be very clear about that, right? The, the correct calculation of automatic differentiation is the wrong derivative. <laughs> so, so. What what that what that basically means then is that you have to be very careful when you when you do automatic differentiation, right? You know, we like to say that oh, you know, automatic differentiation is automatic, but the, these things that you can do in your code, like adaptivity, can actually really screw with how automatic differentiation works. Because again, automatic differentiation on simulations is actually running a simulation under the hood to calculate the derivative, and if your simulation process is not exact. Your derivative process is not exact, and you need to make sure that, however, you know the numerical properties of that, its convergence and all that, that all, all of that needs to. You need to make sure that that's actually happening to this piece of code that nobody ever wrote down, <laughs> which is a scary property. So you know, for forward and reverse, you need to really make sure that that, that this is something you're handling. So next time that someone tells you automatic differentiation is accurate, pull this out. <laughs>
Yeah. So, so the reason why I wanted to show that is really because, you know, I said, do all this stuff with the uh, scientific machine learning and we say, you know, we write all these libraries and someone might go like, why do you spend so much time on, you know, derivatives and libraries? I thought automatic differentiation is a solved problem. Well, this is what we're doing in the Julia automatic differentiation universe, right? The Julia Simo libraries are doing lots of tricks to be able to make sure that you don't run into these problems and writing papers about these types of problems that you could potentially run into if you're to naively do automatic differentiation on this. So, I mean, right now we have not specialized this for enzymes. So you can do weird cases where enzyme will have this kind of behavior, right? And so we will need to specialize different ADs to be able to account for these behaviors and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the simplest way to check it is, you know, calculate the derivative in multiple ways. And so, you know, in, in this talk, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, well, so, so you know, when, when, when I talk about did this whole part, right, I said, okay, you know, there's the calculating the reverse mode derivative, you do it in these three steps, right? But then there's three different choices that you can do here, right? There's, there's, you know, there's a bunch of different choices that you can do here. And so in, inside of the Julia library, there's six different ways that you can calculate the adjoint. You can say, oh, I want to do, you know, tracker adjoint, or I want to do, uh, I want to do interpolating adjoint, quadrature adjoint. So quadrature adjoint uses quad GK for doing this versus interpolating adjoint uh, puts this inside of a solve, right? So all these different ways of calculating it have different numerical properties. And what you should do is you should just double check. Hey, if I calculate the derivative in two very different ways, am I getting the same solution, right? Um, I mean, in general, we've made sure that most of these issues have gone away, but there are some very fundamental issues with derivatives. So you should double check. Um, so for example, what is a fundamental issue of a derivative that you should be aware of, right? So um, here's one. So here, here's a function that's really hard to differentiate. It's the identity function. It's really hard to differentiate. You wanna know what, let's look at the code for the identity function, uh, f of x, um, it, so here's my function, f of x. Um, if x is equal to zero, then I want to return zero, else uh, I return x, right? This is the identity function, right? I, isn't it? Right, when, when, and when x is zero, you return zero, otherwise you return x. That's, that's the identity function, right? Look at this. Okay, let's do automatic differentiation on this. Let's put, you know, let's put zero comma one into here as a dual number, right? Uh, it does the primal thing, so it goes right here. And so it says, oh, this is a constant. So the return is zero comma zero. So the derivative at zero is zero. Single point. Yeah, you don't care about single points. You're, you're, automatic differentiation is allowed to be allowed to be incorrect on a set of measure zero. Um, you know, it's just zero is a very significant measure zero set. I think I told someone that, that the other day that you know, zero is a very significant measure zero set in a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is the, if you do this inside of forward diff, you'll get the you'll get zero. If you do this inside of PyTorch, you do this inside of Jax, you do this inside of I think like Boost C plus plus or all these automatic differentiation libraries will give you out zero here. It's a you know so you automatic differentiation is a tool. It's a nice tool to have. You should know its limitations. Um, its limitations include behaviors like this, and also includes behave weird behaviors on simulators. I don't know if it's able to optimize this case. Yeah, I have to talk with Billy about that. Uh, there, there is a branch of forward diff that actually handles this. It basically says, okay, we have left and right derivatives, and we check with values around it to be able to find out. And but um, it actually has some bugs. So it's actually the master branch of forward diff right now handles this issue, but it also fails other tests, so it's unreleased. And it's been like that for more than a year now. So I don't think it's ever releasing. And which is why I maintain a separate branch on forward diff for 0 0.10.30 something because you know the master branch is not fit passing test. So if you actually want to have any, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a, that's a whole detail, right? But okay, are there any more cases where automatic differentiation is incorrect that you should have that you should be aware of? Right? Well, here's one. Uh chaotic systems. This is fun, right? Because what happens on the chaotic system? So, you know, it, it's really understand chaos, right? The, the, the this here is a solution to the Lorentz equation with two with the, in two different ways, right? Now you see if if you can look really closely here, you see that that says float sixty four and says float thirty two, and you're like, oh, different precision that can give you di different solution. No, 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 no. This is not with different precision. This is solving it in the two ways like this. 
I, I, I didn't have this that, that, that code set up right here. Maybe it, maybe it can show some of you afterwards, right? But the difference in the code that I'm talking about here is where I say the solution solve the solve the ODE uh, with the problem. Do it with this with this solver, and do this with the relative tolerance of one e minus six, right? And then the second way is doing this with one f minus six, right? So it's not a they're both being solved in float sixty four. It's just I'm writing the tolerance in float 64 versus writing the tolerance in float 32 because those are actually two different numbers, right? One, uh, one E minus six minus one F minus six is actually not zero because it's not represented exactly. And so if you have this, if you have this tiny difference, this one, uh, one E minus 15th difference, not in the ODE or any of its definition, but in the tolerance of the adaptivity, then within finite time, you'll get you all of one different uh, different uh, solutions out of it, right? That's chaos, right? That that exponential, di at least small differences will grow over time. Uh, but it's it's a it's a very fun way of showing chaos, right? Where it's just like you could do almost every single thing correct, but you know if you're, if you if one computer uses FMA for for this evaluation, the other does a a times x plus b, right? Numerically, the two chips are not calculating the same thing, so therefore they give different answers. In fact, uh, I have a table. And if you tell me the solution to the Lorentz equation at time 100, I could tell you what operating system you're using, using that table, uh, you know, which, which uh, program and which operating system, because it's actually it's very de de dependent on these details, right? So the Lorentz equation is a classic chaotic example because it has these properties. But, you know, the, the, but notice when I talked about automatic differentiation, the way that we did automatic differentiation is we said, you know, there, there is this dual number x equals x plus y epsilon. And when you put it into functions, you get the value of the function plus the thing here, right, y epsilon. And the reason why you needed that cause, is because you needed to know where you're at in order to calculate the derivative and put that on, put that on, put that on, right? But when we have a chaotic function and we're evaluating it numerically, you don't even have this correct. So how are you gonna get this correct? Right, that's the high level for for what goes on with the chaotic system. It's actually even more interesting than that. Um, it turns out that chaotic systems, uh, you know, the, the exponential divergence, uh, 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 the exponential divergence of the tangent space. Right. So if you if you think about it, this y is also called in other parts of mathematics. It's the tangent space of your manifold, and on um, on chaotic functions. Uh, the, 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 there's an exponential divergence of this tangent space, that exponential actually, the speed at which this value goes to infinity has a name. Its name is, does anyone know? It rhymes with Biafinov exponent. <laughs> Have you ever heard the term Lyapunov exponent? So the Lyapunov exponent in, in, in chaos theory, right? You know, you think about it as, oh, it's the speed at which you have this divergence. Actually, what is diverging is the tangent space. And what that what is diverging then is the error in the calculation of this term right here. In fact, you know, if you, one way you can think about uh, chaos, the, the, the way that you calculate the, uh, the, the, um, the way that you actually calculate the Lyapunov exponent, you can actually do it by, with dual numbers. Put dual numbers into a chaotic uh, system. You watch how fast it, it, it diverges. And that rate of divergence is the the Lyapunov exponent, right? And what that means is that if you if you calculate if you try to use automatic differentiation on a chaotic system, you start solving this chaotic system out. You'll notice that it'll, it'll tell you this derivative is very large, right? It's going to be exponentially growing. It's exponentially growing as fast as the Lyapunov exponent, right? So it will give you a value. You know, if you actually plot this out, you'll see that it's just an exponential curve. So never trust the derivative of forward diff or automatic differentiation on a chaotic system. It's going to just give you a value that's growing and growing and growing to infinity. Um, so, you know, th this is with it just solving from time equals T of it's from zero to 100. If you do this from time T of zero to one, uh, 200, I think it finally goes to inf, right? Cause then it starts to grow even faster. So, so therefore, you know, one way to understand this is, is because if you, if you don't have another way to understand this, the reason is, well, you can never solve the equation in the first place. Uh, so, you know, if you can't, if you can't get that correct, why are you going to think you're going to get that correct? But there's, there's other properties that are really cool about this. But now the big question is, can you actually do differentiation on these kinds of systems anyways, right? Well, to understand that property, you have to understand 
how come we even look, talk about the solution to the Lorenz equation, right? But I just told you that this whole thing is incorrect in the first place. How do we write ODE solvers down that get the butterfly equations, even though I can tell you your solution has O of one error, right? Well, it turns out that, that that a lot of these chaotic systems, well, an ergodic system has a nice property, which is called the uh, the shadowing lemma. And the shadowing lemma means is, is the following, right? So let's say we, we, we solve this ODE and we got some solution, right? But it's chaotic. Which, which means that, you know, this solution has O of one error. Like its error is sufficiently large, you know, you can you can look at it and be like, oh, it's completely wrong by this time, right? The shadowing lemma actually what it actually says is that the solutions of the attractor are dense in the space of the initial conditions. And what do, what does that mean? Well, it means that there exists a different initial condition where if where the analytical solution to that different initial condition, which is epsilon close, is what you actually solve with your numerical solver. It's a wild fact. It's called the shadowing lemma, which means that with these chaotic systems, you so, you get an analytical, you get a, a real solution to the ODE for just a different set of initial conditions that was epsilon close to the one that you had. You know, so you're like, that. That's why people, in the end, you can say, oh, you know, that actually is what the attractor looks like, right? Because that is just that is the real solution for just a very smallly different uh, uh, initial condition, right? And it turns out that that property is, is actually very useful because that what that property tells you is that there's a way to be able to take samples of initial conditions in an area and evolve that forward and see how that sample grows. And if you have a process of letting that go forward and then you have a way of shrinking it, don't want to go into all these details, but you know, if you have a process of carrying forward these particles, you don't necessarily get the derivative of the solution at any time point because you don't know where you are. But what you get is the derivative of the solution over all, uh, uh, averaged over all time, right? So, so uh, th these are called these ergodic properties. So the average of this, you know, if you let this butterfly equation run out, you know, infinitely long, you have this, you have this image, the attractor, right? And you can, and you can start to write down properties like what is the average value of Z in this attractor over all time? What is the average value of X? Turns out that those are the ergodic pro properties and those are well-defined. And the statistics of the of the solution, those statistics are differentiable, right? So that's this is the average quantity of z with respect to this parameter rho of the, of the Lorenz equations. It's almost a line. It's dif you're differentiable with respect to that. And it turns out that you can change your automatic differentiation in such a way that it's working on particles and doing QR factorizations. So that way. It can calculate the derivatives with respect to these ergodic quantities. These are these least uh, share shadowing, adjoint least square shadowing. These are these special di uh, differentiation methods within some of the SIML tools, which handle this type of property, right? But basically, the, the point is, you know, if you have special properties that you know of of your simulation process, you have to be careful on how you calculate the derivatives. Naive calculations of derivatives are completely incorrect. And you need to make sure that you're using special methods to be able to correct for that behavior. And so that was the conclusion of part one. I don't even think I'll get to a lot of the other parts. But I think the conclusion there is just be careful of how you compute derivatives of equation solvers, right? So how do we tie this all back to the world of, of Julia? Well, I mentioned that we're doing all this for scientific machine learning. And so what we've been developing is the SciML interface, right? So SciML is this common interface for Julia equation solvers. It has equation solvers for linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, differential equations that has ODEs, SDEs, and all these things, optimization, partial differential equations. And what we do all day is we make sure that these solvers are both correct, and we just talk about these derivative things like it's the, you know, the, the coolest topic in the world, right? But basically what we do is we just make it so that way when you use these type of equations and, and you model with these types of forms inside of you know, a general automatic differentiation context, we make sure that, that all these different cases of handling chaos and, and all these things, we, we, we basically have ways of fixing the derivatives and doing alternative derivative calculations to account for the errors that can occur because you cannot trust automatic, naive automatic differentiation in the context of equation solves, right? So that, you know, I, I gave a very quick, uh, in, uh, in, you know, introduction to what SciML is, you know, on, on the first day, but I think that this is a much more in-depth one, right? This is what we do all day. We write down these counterexamples of derivatives and we fix them.
And so if you, if you actually go to the documentation and all these things, what you'll find is you'll just find a set of, a whole set of, you know, for example, um, you know, you'll find, you know, for example, in, in the differential equation solvers, so you'll find solvers for different types of equations. And inside of these different types of equations, you'll find tutorials where you say, oh, here's how you solve an ODE, right? Um, so here, for example, here, for example, is the Lorentz equation. Um, and, when, and the way that you write down the Lorentz equation, like we give you a way to, to describe to us this ODE. Um, and when you solve this ODE, then you see the butterfly equations, right? But the core of what makes uh, SciML different from something like, uh, like SciPy is that we have all these tools for calculating these derivatives as part of the system. And this is what we call uh, SciML sensitivity, right? Uh, why is it called SciML sensitivity? Well, because uh, it, remember, I kept on using this term S, 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 right? And a lot of a lot of spaces in in physics and in chemistry and biology, people call that that S term the sensitivity of the model, right? The derivative of the model with respect to parameters. Um, and so we have a whole system for doing this sensitivity analysis of of models. And so, for example, um, you know, if you look at the getting started. If you go here, you'll see, hey, this is the lock of Volterra equations, right? We just define an ODE. We call solving an ODE problem. But now what you can do is you can say, put an ODE solve inside of, a, inside of F. And then we calculate the, the Jacobian of it with automatic differentiation. And it gives you a Jacobian. Again, it's a lot like automatic differentiation. But what it's doing here is not actually automatic differentiation. It's the corrected form to make sure that we count for the error with respect to the pseudo uh, ODE, right? Um, and we also do reverse mode automatic differentiation. Well, when you do reverse mode automatic differentiation here, well, it's not quite just doing reverse mode of the ODE solver because, again, I, I mentioned a lot of things about reversing solvers and all that. And so it's actually doing something under the hood, which is defining a new set of ODEs and solving reverse and everything. But it is doing this in a way that's integrated into the language. So that way, when you when you do zygote gradient, most people don't know that there's these tricks going on under the hood. It just calculates gradients effectively. And people say, oh, that's cool. But now you know a little bit about what's going on underneath there. Um, and now building all this up to the to the final piece, right? So why why have we done all this, and why do we bring in the, the ML concept? Well, again, you know, with scientific with SciML, what we're doing with all this is we're allowing you to integrate machine learning in ways that's optimized. So I kind of skip over that story because I you know there's there's a detail in here. There is a detail in here that I, I do want to kind of mention fairly quickly, which is that when I write down the adjoint equation, it turns out that this this says like you know take the Jacobian and transpose it and multiply it by a vector uh, vector lambda. It turns out that you don't want to actually do that, <laughs> right? So um, it turns out that uh, the way that you write down the mathematics is to take a Jacobian, transpose it, and multiply it by a vector. It turns out that there's a way to use reverse mode automatic differentiation to be able to calculate that without calculating the Jacobian. Again, that's too big of a topic to cover within just this, this lecture. Uh, you can go to the SIM, the SIML book or the 18337 course, which goes all into how reverse mode AD works. But in, in, the, in the end, there's all these little tricks inside of, you know, the way that you write down the math is not the, actually the way that you compute it. And all this is kind of baked under the hood. And this really matters for performance when, um, when, when you're doing... Uh, when you're do when you're integrating neural networks, so if some people ask, um, you know, what are the things that that differential equations that JL is doing in Julia that something like uh, sundials in the C code is not necessarily doing, those kinds of tricks are are exactly where you see a lot of this performance difference. Um, so okay, so now let me go to this example that I described at the very beginning. So this is the discovering relativis to relativistic corrections to uh, binary black hole dynamics, right? And so at the very beginning, I mentioned that there was this that there was this example here, right, of, oh, we, we just stick Newton's equations in there and, uh, and we, we learn what the relativistic corrections are and, and we, we find out what the rest of the dynamics are, right? So that, that's this example. And let me actually kind of show you then what the code looks like. So the code, uh, run, uh, so first of all, we pull in a bunch of these libraries of, of, of the SIML tools and some external pieces, right? Um, and then, you know, there's some setup of, of getting the data, but what, you know, I'm going to skip over the, the setup piece. Effectively, we define an ODE called this relativistic orbit model, which is this, you know, which is exactly these equations here. So it's uh, Newton's equations plus some neural networks defined in there. 
and I say, okay, we, we solve the, when we solve the ODE with our current parameters, our parameters being the weights of the neural network, we get this waveform data. Cool. And the way that we then do this discovery process, well, uh, we, uh, we, we basically we say, okay, let's, let's extend this, uh, let's extend this, uh, well, let's define a neural network and we extend the model with the, with the, with the neural network. We, we stick the model into this, uh, this form, right? So th th again, this is just saying, let's define the neural network form that's gonna be the piece right here. It, um, and, then, uh, and then what we do is we build this loss function, right? Remember, what is this loss function? Well, this loss function is solve the ODE and then check the difference between the ODE and the data. Why do we do it like this? Well, let's go back to that piece of the lecture. Remember when we when we were here, we said, "Oh, you know, you can't just do you can't just train the neural network outside of the simulator and stick it in. You have to put the simulator as part of that loss function. You get much better results, right? So that's this piece right here. This our loss function is you know solve the ODE is actually inside of the loss function. We turn it into an array and then we take the L two difference against our data. So when we start, we have a loss against our data." We stick it into a, in, into a solve loop, and I could talk to you a bit more about um, what what about some of these pieces. But I want to highlight this one, this line right here. So what is this line doing, right? So we have this form that is u prime equals f of u, which is the known the known dynamics, right? Plus neural network of u, which is unknown, right? So what this line what this line is saying is. Take the neural network parameters that we got randomly from the from the machine learning library, multiply them by zero, and then add float, uh, one e minus four times uh, times a, a standard normal random number. Why am I doing that? Well, th this piece right here is just to make it so that way whatever whatever is coming out of this broadcast is the right array type that has the right uh, has the right size and all that, right? But now, but I'm basically replacing all of my neural network parameters with very small with very small random parameters. Why are they very small? Well, because I know that in this context that my neural network starts as an unknown. And so what I want is my, I want my parameters in the neural network to be almost zero. So that way when I start, I start the training process from Newtonian mechanics and I, and I push it out towards, uh, I push it out towards uh, uh, relativistic dynamics, right? Why do I do that? Well, because a random dynamical system that we write down, like just some random neural network is not necessarily a stable system, right? It's just some ODE, not all ODEs are stable, but we know that the Newtonian mechanics is stable. So it's a good starting point for, for, for our optimization. You don't make everything zero because then you have some singularities in the Hessian, that's details, details, but you make them very small. And then you do this optimization process. And what you learn is that it goes from a dynamics of thinking that the dynamics is like an ellipsoid to this kind that that's moving and if you actually plot it in, in a different space, so that's the waveform fitting, I actually think that this one is the, is the most clear one, right? If you think about like the orbits of uh, orbits of uh, of Mercury, right? You know, it changes from being the orbit that is uh, that is the the ellipsoid to the Lissajous pattern that you would expect from a quantum uh, or not, uh, uh, from a relativistic uh, two body problem, right? And so this is the nice example you can get up and running uh, on your own. Uh, I meant to do that during the break, but I forgot to, so I don't have it running right now, but I mean, you, you, it takes, you know, it takes a little bit to install the packages and you can copy paste and run this on, on your own. But I think that, that that's kind of pulling that all together that, you know, how we do all of this is we put solvers in optimization loops, we calculate uh, derivatives of them. And these derivatives are respect to either model parameters or neural network weights. And, it, and you could do this with ODEs, with SDEs and all these different things. Um, but under the hood, there's, that's where all the fun is happening. So um, yeah, I think, uh, how much time do we have? Because I could go into the, the part two, but... Uh... Okay, yeah. So so uh, let me let me then start going into some of these other pieces where, you know, a lot of people start... Use, a lot of people go, okay, the idea is cool, right? The, the idea is cool. I'm starting to use this. And I start to hit some of these issues, right? Um, one of the issues that you might run into is, oh, I start my simulation, I start my process, and it's unstable. So... If you start trying to use these very complex models as part of what you're fitting equations to and fitting parameters to, what do you do in order to improve the process if it's not working the easy way, right? What, what, are, the, what are the things that you should be doing? Um, 
So the SIML libraries has, have a lot of different tools uh, for this, but let me first start by saying, you know, here, here's an animation of what it looks like by default. So here um, I just say, th this is of the case where we have, uh, this is of the case where we have U prime equals a neural network with parameters theta of U. And it's just learning the entire system from scratch, right? Um, what does the loss function look like? Well, the loss function is solve the ODE with your current parameters, take the difference against the data points, and then you know the, take the derivative of that, change your parameters, and do it again, do it again, do it again. And so this is what's this is what's known as single shooting. And I would I would venture to guess that that um, you know, and this is what I kind of describe mathematically. I would venture to guess that ninety nine percent of the people using these libraries write down this single shooting process where you say. I, you know, I want to fit this curve against this data. You know, this curve is defined by f of p, and I'm going to then do optimize, optimize f of p, you know, so that way I find the parameters p, so that way I fit the data, right? This is a process called single shooting. It's done all the time. And it turns out that it's really not a good idea when you start to have these more complex functions. So what do I mean by that? So single shooting is not numerically robust. And what, and there's many reasons for that. So so for example, uh, what's one what's one reason for that? And let me just kind of start to, to to show the piece here. So one reason why you might want not want to do that, especially if you have like say a simulation process, is that a simulation process can be fairly you know whether you can actually calculate the 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 simulation can be itself dependent on parameters. What do I mean by that? Well, let, let's let's take the simplest case in, in ODE world. You have u prime, u prime equals alpha u, right? This is just an exponential, right? And so let's just say you said, okay, you know, I want to solve this from time equals uh, time zero to to one hundred, right? Well, if you if you start with your guess of being alpha one alpha equals one, maybe that's actually close to your data points. You know, maybe well maybe that's actually close to your data points. But your solver might go to infinity before it actually gets to the end here, because exponentials grow exponentially fast. And so, writing down this process, you might you might hit these exponentials. Or what? Another thing that will happen is if you're sli slightly below your data points. Let's say you're slightly below your data points. Your gradient says, "Oh, increase alpha a little bit." Alpha goes to alpha equals one point five, and suddenly you get that your loss is equal to infinity, and then your optimizer stops. Right. So the, the issue with a lot of simulation processes is that, you know, if you have infinites that can happen in certain parts of your parameter space, your optimization process can just stop. And you, there's no way to calculate the derivative when you have this infinity. And, yeah. So, so, so what, do you, what do you do in these cases? Well, there's a lot of different processes that, that you can do. So, uh, so what, what are some things you can do here that are in these libraries? So one of the things that you can do is what's called multiple shooting. So let's say we wanted to fit this data, right? So we have these data points, which is, you know, these big squares here. Right? And so what we can do is we can say, well, let's let's have some pseudo initial conditions. And from these pseudo initial conditions, let's solve the ODE. All right, so we solve the ODE from a bunch of different initial conditions. Well, then what, what, what actually needs to be true so that way this is a solution to the, to the ODE? Well, what we need is that we need the difference between the end, right? Or I'm not going to put another box, I guess. Let me do this as a star. The difference between this star and that X should be zero, right? Because if we actually had the solution to our ODE, right, all of, all of our initial conditions along the way should line up uh, on the actual solution, right? So what you do with multiple shootings, you take these extra, you know, take extra initial conditions and then require, you know, solve the, the ith solution at the endpoint minus um, the ith solution or the ith plus one solution at its initial condition is equal to zero, right? So you can either require that by making that be extra terms in loss function, um, or you can do this by doing an, uh, an, uh, an optimization 
a process that is an uh, that is uh, equality constrained. Either way, you can impose this property as part of the loss function. And now, what are you actually optimizing for? Optimize for, well, you want to optimize for your parameters. And what else do you optimize for? The pseudo initial conditions, right? What you need to do is you need to keep on, you need to move around these initial conditions until you find them so that way they all line up. So you find what are the correct initial conditions at future points in time and what are the parameters, right? And so when I talk about like, oh, you know, you just fit these simulators, you fit these simulators. Well, what's actually going on is that when it's calculating derivatives, it's modifying your simulator to calculate the derivatives. And oh, when if you actually want to be doing this fitting well, you also want to modify your simulation to not actually be doing the real process, but some like pseudo process for small steps in order to improve the, the simulation as well. In fact, uh, there, there's another augmentation that you can do here where um, this, this is called a, a collocation type method where you say, well, let's say I don't, don't want to, uh, let's say I don't want to differentiate the simulator at all, or let's say I want to find a good initial starting point for this, this process. What you can do is you can say, well, let's say I have these, these as my, my data points, right? I can put a line through them and I can calculate an estimated derivative at each point. So this is like u tilde prime, u tilde prime, right? And so if u prime is supposed to equal to f, then, then you, what you can do is you can say that like you, this u tilde prime of i minus f of u tilde, the data point i, this should be equal to zero, you know, approximately. And so let's sum them up. Let's sum them up over i. And this is our loss function, right? So in, instead of actually using the ODE solver to calculate solutions, you can uh, you you can take you know, you can approximate derivatives at your data points by putting a line through them, and then this should be true at every single data point. Where if this derivative is sufficiently correct, then then we should be able to fit this. Now, what's the issue with this kind of approach? Well, this is similar to the issue that we would have with that climate model example, right? that it won't necessarily converge all the way um, because the derivative out estimations that you're gonna get here from say a cubic spline are not gonna be so correct. But this is a very good way to start off your, your, your process. So you might wanna start with this process to be able to get your initial, uh, initial parameter estimates and then complete it by doing you know, a multiple shooting or single shooting approach. Right. So ba basically what, what I'm saying here is that, you know, you don't necessarily, you know, just because you can stick in a, an ODE solver inside with parameters and then just say, oh, calculate the derivative and optimize it doesn't mean you should. You should be doing other things as well, which is sad because we, we hope we can automate everything for you. But it turns out there's more things to, to do. In fact, um, as, as, a, as a very interesting kind of extra piece here, I like to show people this this prediction error method, which is used a lot inside of inside of control theory, but I don't really see it as much. So what, what is going on here? So in this case, uh, in this case, what we have is we have a, uh, a pendulum equation, right? Uh, pendulums are actually extremely hard. I love talking about how hard pendulums are. If you want to, pendulums are one of the most difficult equations to solve. And if you, if you, if you want to talk about that in more detail, I'd be happy to. Um, but okay, so, so here's a pendulum equation written, uh, you know, just uh, the, the derivative uh, derivative of position is equal to velocity. Derivative of velocity is equal to pendulum equation, right? Every physicist here knows the pendulum. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we have we have data points. So we we have we have this. Uh, let me let me erase here again so I can show. So we, 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 we have data points, right? And these data points come from, come from a pendulum. And so, you know, if you're to naively just run a simulator, you might be off from it and you say, oh, now let's perturb it towards the pendulum, but that might be unstable or might have some bad properties. So here's what we're going to do, right? We're going to modify our equations. So that way, anytime we start getting close to a data point, we kind of get pulled towards that data point. Right, and so it, it, uh, you can see the modification right here, right? So instead of 
instead of using just the instead of just using you know the derivative of position is velocity, the derivative of position is velocity plus k times e, where e is this difference, uh, e is this kind of difference from 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 a data point. Where we what we're going to do is we're going to take a again an interpolation through these data points, and we're going to use that difference from from where we would expect to be from the data. We're going to to add it to here, right? You can actually think about this as like a common filter um, in a in a in some in kind of a continuous sense, right? And now it has this interesting property that if you are actually on the data, then the perturbation is zero, and so it has not actually changed your it has actually not changed the the parameters that optimize your equation. But what it does do is it makes it so that way you're not accidentally going to go to infinity because you've now you've now added an artificial force that's pulling you you back towards the equation. Uh, the, well, there's ways to be able to do this where you're interpreting. So, so, okay, this is with a B-spline. You can do a B-spline regression to take into account noise. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do here um, to be able to make it noise robust. But yeah, that, that becomes a whole, a whole thing. So the question was, uh, this assumes no noise. Yeah, the way that I wrote this down assumes no noise, but there's extensions you can do to handle all that. Um, but the key here is that if, if you actually look at this, then the optimal, the optimal point has not moved, right? The optimal point is still in the same spot, but this is actually a very good way to get rid of a lot of the pseudo, uh, pseudo minima. So what I'm looking at here is this is my loss function, right? So this is the value of the loss function, and this is the, uh, and this is the, pendulum length, the L inside of here, right? So if you're trying to do this optimization and find the right parameter for your, for your model, you know, and you just say, oh, you know, just do the L2 difference. You solve the model to do the difference. If you just do that process, what you'll see is that this is the loss landscape you get in blue, which is a very difficult optimization problem to find out the right, the right pendulum length, right? But if you just do this process with this modified simulation, this modified simulation has a different loss function, which actually has one global minima at right at the same point as before. So again, you know, so sim simulators are really cool. We write a lot of cool simulation things, but when you want to calculate derivatives, you want to change your simulation. And when you want to fit things, you want to change your simulation. So like your simulation is, you should almost think about it as like, this, your, your normal simulator is what the physics actually does, but when you're doing inverse problems and other things like that, you don't necessarily want to do the same physics. Um, there's other tricks to, to do as well. So uh, so what, what am I showing here? Well, what I'm showing here is this case of we're trying to find the parameters of this of this uh, neural network ODE that solves the equation. Um, and when, and, and you know, so we're trying to find the parameters of the orange that make it match the, the blue. And what happens here is it gets stuck at a local minima. This local minima is the orange. Why is this a local minima? Well, if, if you think about it, it actually is kind of easy. Uh, if, if you pull down the orange a little bit here to, mat, to match closer to the data, then you're also pulling it away from the blue at the top there. And if you pull it down here, well, okay, you're doing better here, but you're up here. So if you think about it, that's actually a really nice lo local minima that it found, right? It's right in the middle where if you move it downwards, you're, you move it downwards or you move it upwards, you're gonna increase your, 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 your loss. So how do you get how do you get beyond this issue? Well, you don't necessarily want to fit by just using your normal simulation process. So here, instead of fitting from time zero to five, we do a fit from time zero to one twenty five, or one point two five. Ah, we fit that first, then we use that as an initial condition to fit from one to three, and we use that as an initial condition to fit from one to five, and now it's done it just fine, right? So, you know, the reason is because if we tried to pull down over here, it's going it, to, you know, we're already incorrect on this part of the equation. So it shouldn't be part of our loss function until we've made sure that we're correct at the beginning. It's a bit related to multi-shooting. Yeah, so multiple shooting, multiple shooting is kind of, it, it, it's forcing correctness in the future, right, in, in, in a different way, right? Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's so they're, they're very related in different ways. Um, and so yeah, so when I you know uh, I mentioned here like in, in the notes that you know when when you if you go back to this example and, and when I show it right you know there was a trick inside of here as well that the neural network starts from a small perturbation. If you get rid of that trick, it actually you know it's doing a single shooting process and it'll actually fail to converge at at the start uh, for a lot of the uh, the neural network's initial conditions. So 
basically what I'm saying then is that yes, you know, you all all you have to do in order to fit things with with equations is you just stick the equation solver inside of an optimization loop, but also not really. So you know that there's caveats in the you know the SIMO sensitivity documentation and DiffEQ flux. The documentation goes into all these different tricks you can do or building out new libraries over time that help people to do this kind of uh, curve fitting better. But the 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 conclusion of part two really is uh, you know don't use this the simple idea of, of curve fitting is f of p calculate it calculate derivatives on the loss function, but don't really do that. <laughs> Uh, in almost every case, there's a there's a better thing to do, and there's libraries that help in a lot of situations. Um, you know, a, a sidebar. So, so um, as a small little sidebar, I do want to mention. You know, uh, one thing that I've kind of completely glossed over is, you know, oh, when you do this with neural networks embedded into there, what neural networks do you choose, right? Um, so now I want to finally address that problem of what neural networks are we choosing in the first place. Well, it turns out that. You know, when, when you're talking about simulation processes and all these things that have adaptivity in them, you're not necessarily always going forwards in time, right? You might go forwards in time and then it might say, oh, I approximate the solution there and then I reject it and I go backwards in time. And what this means is that if you, if you stick neural networks inside of, your, inside of an, uh, a solver, assuming that it's always going to be going forwards in time and that, solver ha that neural network has state, that state is not going to be correct. So what kind of neural networks have, have state, RNNs, grooves, you know, any, I, I think that Lux makes this very clear because uh, Lux has, a, has actually a state value and if that state value is not an empty name tuple, then the neural network has state. And for any neural network that has state, you cannot use them in solvers with adaptivity because you cannot guarantee that your step is always going forward. So you, you would need to reverse your state if, if that was the case. Um, so, you know, you do have to be careful when, when doing these kinds of processes. And you also have to be careful of properties like vanishing gradients. So if you're unfamiliar with the vanishing gradient problem, um, if, you're, if your activation function is saturating, so for example, if you use a tan H activation function, right, it has this property that its, its derivatives are effectively zero and zero at the two ends. What happens is if you put that neural network inside of an ODE and you run that ODE sufficiently long, a lot of those gradients end up turning into the, either the zero inside of the regime where your gradient, both uh, your gradient is zero. And what that means is you can run this optimization process for a long time and you basically get nowhere because all your gradients are zeros. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that when you're doing this kind of you know, when you're put, mixing machine learning and neural networks with simulators and expensive functions, you need to really make sure, you know, especially when you have repeated function evaluations, whether it's an ODE, Newton's method, fun, uh, function iteration, like differentiating any of these things that have repeated evaluation, you need to make sure that your process has a non-saturating side to it or your activation functions have a non-saturating side in order to make sure that you're, you have a, you know, your gradients don't go to zero. So soft plus is one of these uh, fun activation functions that has this property that it is both, you know, it is both a smooth function and, you know, so it's a smooth function, which means it works nicely with ODE solvers that assume that gradients exist. Uh, so it has that property, plus it also has the property of not having any vanishing gradients. So, you know, you generally don't need to worry too much in SciML. Like we, we don't worry too much about what neural network architectures we're choosing other than the fact that we need to make sure that, again, we need to make sure that everything has good numerical properties, which requires that you don't break the assumptions of your solvers and that you don't break the assumptions of, um, and you don't break the assumptions of, well, vanishing gradients and, and that, that whole issue as well. So again, it's like, when, 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 you, when you start to put, you know, uh, solvers and all these things into optimization loops, we try to make sure that you know, we say, oh, automatic differentiation works, you know, try automatic differentiation, put an optimizer. But in practice, you need to actually worry about numerical analysis issues because, you know, the, the, the things that you're generating for gradients is a pseudo process that has its numerical properties. And, you know, the things that you're putting into your solver are making your solver act in different ways by being non-smooth or having vanishing gradients. And you do need to worry about these properties to some extent. Um, Hopefully in the future we can make that stuff fully automated, but uh, that's that's the stuff to be aware of. I guess, uh, I mean, the, 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 this this part three is a very short story if I have the time for it. Yeah, cool, I do. Let me uh, make sure I check the chat here. Um, oh, okay. Just about a blackboard, yeah. 
Yeah, so so I'd, I'd say that the thing, so the question was all about, you know, what do I do when if I need to have uncertainties in my measurement, right? Um, I would say check out the Bayesian Neural ODE paper. That's like a nice example of how do you extend uh, scientific machine learning into uh, in, into this space of, of Bayesian estimation, right? Um, it turns out that, you know, the things that you really need to make uh, Bayesian estimation work, right, are derivatives, right? If you calculate the derivatives of your code, then you can do variational inference and you can do Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, right? And so with that, you can extend a lot of what you do with scientific machine learning to scientific machine learning where you're then getting posterior estimations on functions. So what do you choose as your prior? Well, remember that I mentioned that, you know, inside of, inside of the neural network libraries, right? Neural network libraries have a way of actually choosing, you know, there's, there's a distribution of, of initial conditions, which is known to be a, a, a strong spread over all possible functions, right? Uh, there's a way to actually say that in, in a more, a nice way, but there's like a Wishart distribution that's used as as the neural network weight initialization, right? Um, so what you can do is you can say that that's your that's your prior distribution, right? That you know the the, the same distribution that it, that all I mean all the neural network libraries use the same one because there's nice properties to it. You know you let your your prior distribution for each of your neural network weights be given by this Wishart dis distribution, and then you and then you do, and then you say, put this into Turing or some other Bayesian estimation, prob, uh, uh, you know, probabilistic programming environment to get uh, posteriors over the neural network weights, right? And now there's two, in some interesting things you can do with that, right? So one of it is, well, every single every single uh, point in your posterior over your neural network weights, you can solve the the ODE with that neural network, and each one is giving you a representation of a missing function, right? But remember back to the case where you say, oh, what we really want to do is we want to learn some physics, right? So there's a, there's a nice example in here of how to how to connect those two together where, um, da, 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 going down. So what we do in a given case is we say, well, um, let's say we want to fit this uh, Fisher KPP equation, right? So we do this as like a convolution plus a neural network. I mean, it's one of these PDE examples again, where there's a neural network capturing a missing nonlinearity. And what we do in this case is we train the neural network. Uh, well, we, we replace training of the neural network with uh, Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo to give us a representation of the posterior of the weights of the neural network, right? And once we have a posterior uh, of the weights in the neural network, right, we have predictions of what the uh, of of what the solution would have done that are you know nice and fitting, but once we have that, we actually have representations of what functions could be missing. Right, every sample from our posterior is a is a is a function. Right, and so what we can do is we can take samples of uh we we, we could take samples from the posterior, and on each sample we get a we get a neural network, and we can run symbolic regression on that neural network, and so we sample from our posterior you know a few hundred times. Um, and we, each time we run a different symbolic regression, and every time we run the symbolic regression, it can give us different results. And it turns out that 73% of the time it gives us a quadratic function, and 27% 27% of the time it gave us a cubic function. And what it was supposed to be learning was that the extra function was a, was supposed to be quadratic, right? And so it gives you a way to be able to extend this this model discovery where you can start to say, well, you know. There's a lot of terms in our symbolic regression. Like, you know, I think there was an earlier, uh, there's an earlier case that we showed a symbolic regression earlier in the day, right? You know, there could be a lot of terms in that symbolic regression. And this approach of, of doing a neural network fit to get a posterior over all the functions and then sampling them and rerunning different symbolic regressions is able to tell you what percentage of the time your symbolic regression actually sees these different terms and gives you a nice way to then be able to say, oh, 99% of the time I'm seeing these terms and then all and every, you know, all these other terms that they only show up randomly. And what we find when, when we do this in practice is that the terms that are showing up most of the time are the terms that we actually use to generate the data in our test cases. So, um, you know, so it's, it's, it, it, it does give you some nice ways to extend model discovery to have some form of error bars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
HMT would get stuck in, in one of them and never get out of there. Yes, and it's not an easy base and estimation process. So a lot of the work that's ongoing right now is just improving that and the ADVI. And in fact, variation, variational inference does not work for this stuff very well at all. And that's a whole story of its own. Um, but yeah, I, I think you know, one, one of the recent things that we put out was a Bayesian uh, chemical reaction neural networks, right? Uh, so this is with one of the students that I have. It, uh, And and you know so so this kind of mixes uh, two properties. So one one property is that it's a very specific kind of neural network that is only able to represent uh, chemical reaction type equations. So it's like putting it into a smaller a, a smaller space, and then it's looking at um, using different ways of doing uh, um, do different ways of doing the Bayesian estimation. Uh, so preconditioned SGLD in a specific way. Without doing the precondition a part of it, it's just not a stable process at all. And so, yeah, in, or, in order, there's a lot of ongoing work just to be able to improve the numerics of of doing these kind of fitting. Yeah, it's it's definitely not trivial, and definitely, you know, it's something that the libraries will technically all work out right now. If you stick a neural ODE or neural network defined, you know, UDE inside of one inside of Turing, it will calculate it, right? But whether it will calculate it in a nice, fast, stable manner, uh, in a way that's you know, searching over the whole space and whatnot. And that's not really well known at this point. Yeah, so I, I want to I want to get to this this last little piece, which is kind of fun. Then you know, so what are methods that ignore such derivative issues that you know are interesting to explore other ways of doing machine learning of things related to simulators? Right, um, is a very underexplored part of the literature. So I like to kind of point out its existence. Um, so one of the so the, the challenge problem that we, that we came up with that that led us to here was this idea of you know how do we how do we find a machine learning architecture that gives us uh, predictions that look a lot like this system so this is a Arago um, this is one of these stiff ODEs uh, and stiff ODEs have these properties that you have these very sharp turns right um, and another way of talking about stiff ODEs is that Oh, um, they, they cannot be solved by uh, Euler's method, right? So explicit Runge-Kutta methods, you know, the standard way that I've been writing down on the board, how you solve it, all of those ODE solvers end up being unstable unless your delta T is very, very close to zero. And so it turns out that you have to use special ODE solvers in order to even solve these kinds of things. And, and what that means is that a lot of neural network architectures are not very good at representing their solution. Um, and the reason is if you actually look at things like recurrent neural networks or uh, residual neural networks, a residual neural network, right? right? Here's a fun property. So if you let, you know, U prime equals neural network of U, right? Uh, and if you do Euler's method on that, UN plus one equals UN plus uh, delta T uh, neural network of U. It turns out that this thing in, in machine learning has a name. This is the residual uh, neural network, which is a uh, neural network, which is equal to Euler's method on uh, U prime equals neural network of U, right? So it's kind of interesting that, you know, if you actually look at some of these, uh, some of these machine learning techniques that people do in practice, you can actually relate them back to simulation processes and say, oh, this neural network that you wrote down is Euler's method on this ODE. And here's a case that, you know, if you want to then apply it to learn this ODE, well, we know that o Euler's method is unstable on this ODE. So this neural network architecture is not likely to do well, right? <laughs> So what, what can you do in these cases? Well, it turns out that there's something kind of funny. So, um, so you know, why should everyone always care about ODE? So it's because even if you're not using ODE solvers, you are using ODE solvers. Uh, where are you using ODE solvers? Well, let's say you're doing gradient descent, right? Gradient descent is, uh, you know, my parameters n plus one equals parameters some n plus alpha, my learning rate, <coughs> GG. Um, times uh, uh, times this uh, gradient uh, with respect to my, my function at, at the given parameters, right? Does this look familiar to anybody? Let learning rate go to zero. And what happens? What is this solving?
p prime equals to gra the gradient of, G of your loss function with respect to p. If you do Euler's method on this ODE, you get gradient descent. So if you're doing optimization, hey guys, you're, you're just solving ODEs. It's just, it just looks different, right? You don't really, in, the difference in the optimization cases is you don't necessarily care that you're solving the ODE accurately. As long as your value goes down, you're okay. And so you end up taking a lot of, of skips in order to just say, okay, I don't really need to care about the accuracy of this ODE that I'm solving. But the 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 gradient descent is just Euler's method on the, on the, on the ODE defined by the gradient flow. And knowing whether you're going to go to the minima is, is all done by doing analyses on this continuous for, uh, formulation, right? So why, why, do, why does this matter? Well, um, you know, I said that there's some ODEs that are very difficult to solve. And what someone has, had been looking at inside of the, the uh, machine learning literature and the CIML literature is, you know, to summarize it, ass essentially, if you have stiffness inside of, uh, if you have stiffness or these difficult properties inside of your, fun inside the function that you're trying to learn, Right, so if you have if you have difficult if your function that you're trying to learn is difficult, what that corresponds to is that this the, uh, what you can show is that this you know that you end up having that this this ODE that you have for the gradient flow is actually stiff, which makes Euler's method and thus gradient descent unstable. Right? How do you fix that instability? Well, you have to send delta t goes to zero, but in gradient descent land, you call that the learning rate. Right? So it's you know, so what you basically show then is that inside of these, if you're trying to fit models that have these kind of stiffness properties, then you need to use either very small learning rates or you need to use different types of optimizers that are implicit. It turns out that Newton's method is implicit Euler on this thing, and you could go on and on. But um, the key property here is that, you know, the same numerical properties that make ODE solving difficult actually show up in the optimization space. So can you start to do things that avoid uh, that avoid all of this altogether, right? Well, let me let me show you a trick that ends up being really nice. So this trick is so, so let's write down this let's write down this uh this So what was our standard neural network? Our standard neural network function is neural network of u, right? Remember that this is like a w1. It was a weight uh, times u plus b1, right? b1 times sigma. And then w2 plus b2 sigma2, right? And, you know, you uh, the number of layers. So if you ever heard like, oh, you know, this is a deep neural network, right? That just means that you make one, two, three, four. You just do this with more layers. It's not interesting, right? So we could just write down two and, and see what's going on here. Um, so, okay. And so what we want to do is, is, is we generally want to optimize. We want to optimize um, W1, W2, uh, B1, B2, right? So this is, this is our, uh, this is our general problem, right? But now, by by the by by the, the by the universal approximation theorem, you actually only need two layers. So I can actually let uh, sigma two equal um, the identity function. So let me just uh, delete this here. Right. So this is actually the smallest neural network that I can get away with that still has the universal approximation property. Right. And now, uh, now, uh, you know, trick. Let w sub one um, be equal some, to some constant random matrix. Oh, and let b b one be equal to some constant. Yeah, huh. You can do that. Yeah, you can. Actually, this will still satisfy universal approximation theorem in some contexts, right? But what happens then if this is constant and this is constant? Well, you can take every single one of your data points, and you can take each one of your data points and stick them through this in terms of your nonlinearity. And what, and what you end up getting is you get some data set, which is, you know, some u, you know, w2u plus b2 equals 
you know, why that what's supposed to come out in your data set. And it turns out that you can solve this with a linear regression, right? So you can do a QR factorization or an SVD. And now you could do this actually inside of the, the ODE context as well. So you can say X prime, X prime equals um, sigma uh, W uh, X plus B. Um, and then Y is equal to W out um, of X. And then you say that th these two things are, are constant and let's only fit uh, W out. You can prove that that actually has a universal approximation theorem. It could fit all possible continuous uh, functions, but fitting this W out can be done only by doing a QR factorization or an SVD against your data. So what, what does this actually look like in practice? Well, this right here is actually defining an ODE that's doing its own thing. So you can almost think about it as, you know, you, you're, you, you have some process, right? There's some random process here. And if you have a very high dimensional random process, like here's the question. If you have a very high dimensional random process where like everything is going on. So let's say you have a simulation of the entire world, right? You know, there's inside of the simulation, you have Keanu Reeves, you have, you know, you, you, you have, uh, you know, Elvis Presley and you have Elvis Presley and, and Keanu Reeves dating each other, right? Like literally everything is inside of the simulation if you make it uh, high enough dimensional, right? Can you, can you go from this simulation can you create a projection that matches the process that you want to hit? Well, I mean, if you have a billion dimensions, you should be able to find some projection that works, right? And that's effectively what's going on here, right? So you have some pseudo process, which if these things are fixed, it's just some random pseudo process, which is, you know, high enough dimensions doing every possible thing. And you, what you're looking for is a linear projection from that pseudo process to your real process. So what is this thing? What is this thing called? This is called an, uh, an echo. This is called an echo state network, and this is the continuous time echo state network. Uh, so this is of a weird branch of offshoot of machine learning called reservoir computing, and it turns out that there are these cases where you know. So here's a case where your ODE. I'm writing it inside of log scale. Like this thing goes up extremely fast. So this is one of these things that you know you require specific solvers to be able to handle the fact that you have derivatives that are different by um, by 10 to the, you know, 10 to the ninth differences in your values. Um, so special ODE solvers are required to handle this. And so if you try most machine learning methods, right, you know, if you, if you look at this machine learning method, this is, uh, this is your um, LSTM, right? Your standard time series method shoots up to infinity and shoots back down, right? It has no idea what to do in these unstable cases. But then these continuous time echo state networks are able to handle this, the, these types of equations quite easily. And, it, and the fitting process requires no gradient descent at all. It's just a backslash. Um, and so, you know, there's this, there's this whole li set of libraries called reservoircomputing.jl that are able to, to learn different equations. And here it's actually learning on um, Lorentz equation. It's learning how to predict values that would be on the, on the, um, on the what's the word? The, uh, the, the butterfly wings, right? So it's learning uh, from, from a given set how to predict things that would still be on the butterfly wings. Uh, because again, it doesn't run into these gradient issues because it's calculating no gradients. It's just doing a fit of these uh, of what's known as these reservoirs, right? So again, you have this thing known as a reservoir process, um, which is kind of a large system, and you keep that thing constant, and you learn projections from your large system. And it turns out to be a very nice way to learn a lot of, a lot of systems. And I'll, I'll stop it there because that's a that's a fun one. But yeah, I mean, if you never checked out reservoir computing. Uh, yeah, you check it out. It's a, it's, it's a different way to do machine learning, which is uh, quite interesting. And we have some really good tools in the Julie ecosystem for doing that. So. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah. This was a really, really nice introduction to this uh, topic. Uh, well, let me put this on. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Of course, we will have also discussion time afterwards. Uh, I don't see any questions in Zoom. Yeah. 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 So the, the question was, in this reservoir, W has to be big, like really big. Uh, and that's that's the direct quote. He said it with the, the word big twice like that. And yes, that is that is the case. It needs to be like big, really big. Well. 
in, in some of these cases, for example, to learn a size, um, to learn a size uh, three ODE, we had to uh, send it up into a space. I think the projection was into a 300 dimensional space, um, which is not huge, right? And so like the backslash in solves, I mean, the SVD and everything, it still solves in under a second. So it's, you know, very, I would say if you if you try some of these methods, you'll see that they're still just a lot easier than uh, than standard machine learning. But yeah, I mean, you, you do have to project it into a rather large space. And I can't tell you how big that space has to be because that how big that has to be depends on the complexity of the equations you're trying to fit. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, I would say we stop here today's session. Many thanks for everyone. Many thanks, Chris, again. Uh, it's always good to know what <laughs> happens behind the scene. Use differential equations 